Namaskar, good evening, welcome firstly, welcome everyone whoever has finished what could possibly be a monumental day in your life, what could possibly be a day when you have decided your future and if you have gotten this far well, welcome once again, congratulations firstly on appearing and uh, what is to be hope for, hoped as a sincere appeared, a sincere attempt at the UPSC civil services preliminary examinations for the year 2020. Welcome everyone whoever is joining me as we will be discussing a threadbare analysis of each and every question, section wise analysis, section wise sources to be analyzed and finally we will be taking a look at the answer key. But before I seriously get into all of that, all the analysis and all the dissection, may I at this moment congratulate each and every one of you. The decision that you had taken, you have followed through on it and now it's time for the, well you can say the reflections will begin, the analysis will begin, the post-mortem will begin but that does not take away from the fact that you indeed did something monumental today. Now uh, looking at the first sense of the paper, okay, we will move paper to paper GS1 and GS2, CSAT, uh, GS1, again if you are just joining me quickly, let me know where you are joining me from, what was the sense of the paper, how many attempts did you have, these informations will be greatly helpful but again going forward. So what's the agenda for the day? How are we going to go about analyzing the answer keys, the all important answer keys? Yes, so what we are going to be doing is looking at section wise approach. That's the way we have decided to do, a section wise approach. So we will have specialists of each subject come in and discuss the questions with you. They will discuss the sources with you, they will address your doubts, all of that will happen over the course of the next two, three, four hours, however long it takes, so as to satisfy each and everyone who is joining us live on this special stream, on a day when Parliament of India was inaugurated and on a day possibly 1105 of you may have taken the first step to become a part of the steel frame of India, of the famed bureaucracy of India. All right, now that has been put forward, now that problem has been sorted, what we are going to do is jump straight into it. Again, before I do start this whole session, this whole endeavor on behalf of Study IQ IAS English, may I request each and every one of you, all our dear viewers, please let us know how was your paper, what's your assessment, what's your gut feeling saying at this hour, all right? And let us know how you intend to go forward, what's your preparation for mains gonna look like, all of that is going to depend on the coming few hours as we will be looking at the comprehensive answer key. So but before I do begin, may I inform you that for GS1, the paper 1 paper, alright, we will be exclusively looking at set A. So if you do have set A with you, well you are an inherent advantage, but if you do not, we'll make a mental note of it, set A is what we will be discussing and we will begin with geography. The beta noir in this examination, so many questions asked from geography, from maps, from environment, making a major comeback in so far as uh, civil services preliminary examination is concerned. So that will be our primary agenda and thereafter we'll move on to subject wise analysis and discussions. All right, so with that having been said, let's jump straight into the questions that have been put forward by the UPSC. Now the first question. Jhelum river passes through Vular lake, Krishna river directly feeds Koleru lake, meandering of Gandak river formed Kavar lake. Now Kavar lake obviously most of you must be aware, it's in the state of Bihar, alright, this is in this is in JNK. Now what are you to understand here, what's the, what's the problem here? So Jhelum river essentially which starts from Verinag, if you are aware of this, has around five tributaries and eventually it flows into, it passes through Vular Lake, it passes through Vular Lake, thereafter 
it goes into the POK, passes to Srinagar. Before that, passes goes into the POK where it meets the Neelam River. So, statement one holds for us that indeed Jhelum River passes through the Vular Lake. So, this is correct. All right, statement one is correct. Statement two, Krishna River directly feeds. Now, this is the operative word here that we have to look at. Does Krishna River directly feed the Koleru Lake? Now, if you were to go back and if you were to look at the notes that you have prepared, you will know that there are two seasonal tributaries, two seasonal water bodies that feed the Koleru Lake. All right. So, Krishna River does not feed the Koleru Lake directly. Okay. This does not happen. The two tributaries, the two seasonal ones that feed the Koleru Lake. If any of you know the answer, let me know in the chat. Let me know in the chat very quickly. Before I close the question, I'll let you know which are those two seasonal tributaries that feed the Koleru Lake. Thereafter, the third one, meandering of the Gandak River formed the Kavar Lake. Now, what is meandering? The river running its course and taking a U-turn. That's meandering, essentially forming an oxbow lake. You are looking at something like this being the course of the river, which is essentially what has happened with Kavar Lake. In the state of Bihar, Kavar Lake formed on the Budhi Gandak. It's an oxbow lake on the river Budhi Gandak, which means with number two being incorrect. So we are left with two statements that are correct from the above option, which means my answer here is B only two. Now, this is another problem. This is another problem area that most candidates would have faced this year, that UPSC has quite conveniently changed the way the options are presented. No longer can you eliminate your way to find an answer, right? So, that has been a pressure point for candidates this year, but you have to realize that it's only going to get tougher. Changes, unexpected ones may be thrown at you. That's the nature of the game. That's the nature of the beast that is UPSC. All right. So here my first, we begin this whole session, this marathon answer key session with the answer to the first question being B. Only two of the answers, two of the statements here are correct. Right. Moving forward. Moving forward. Now let's have a look at this question. It's about ports now. Ports, Kamaraj port, Mundra port, Vishakhapatnam port, right? So have a look at the question quickly. Kamaraj port, the first major port in India registered as a company. The Mundra port, the largest privately owned port in India, in the news in the recent past. <coughs> regular watchers, regular followers of the news will know that a massive drug haul was found in the Mundra port, which is why probably UP has, UPSC has decided to go ahead and venture and ask you a particular question about Mundra port. There, thereafter, you have the bigger ports, Jawaharlal Nehru port in Navi Mumbai. Again, another massive port, a port that looks after the exports of India. So, now let's look at the options one by one. Kamaraj port. Yes, do we have any answers? Anyone who's appeared this, this uh, morning, what's your attempt being? What's your guess was? What was your guess? Very quickly. Very quickly. Let's have the answers here. What was your understanding of this? Okay. So, the Kamaraj port is essentially on the Koromandal coast. You have it on the Koromandal coast, just north of the capital city of Chennai. Not very far, in fact. Less than 25 kilometers from Chennai, you have the Kamaraj port. And this is the first major port in India that has been registered as a company. It's a publicly owned company headed by a serving IAS who is the managing director of that company. So this statement does become correct. Thereafter, we look at the Mundra port. Now, the largest privately owned port in India, which means the ownership is in private hands. No guesses there who is owning this. This is owned by Adani. The Adani group owns the Mundra port. Again, in the news, because a massive drug haul was found there, there was a lot of furor and uproar about that. So, this is correct. Thereafter, the third one, Vishakha Patnam. 
So now the largest container port, which is the largest container port, okay? The largest container port in India is the Navi Mumbai port. The Navi Mumbai port, also known as the Jawaharlal Nehru port. This is the largest container port in India, close to 40%. Uh, it's lead over the next, the rank two, in terms of container capacity. Which means, my answer here is B. Two pairs are correct, Kamaraj port and Mundra port. Okay, Vishakhapatnam port is not the largest container port in India. In fact, it's the Jawaharlal Nehru port, like I told you, in Navi Mumbai, that has that claim to fame. Okay, so that leaves us with just two correct here, which means two pairs are correctly matched. Answer here being B. Clear enough? Okay. Whoever is joining us, quickly, let me tell you, well, this is a marathon session. We will be discussing subject-wise analysis of all the questions that was asked earlier this morning. First, GS1 and thereafter, CSAT. Now, what are the first recommendations, the first Instinct about Seaside, I'm yet to hear from you students, but if you're joining us, get ahead and get typing in the comment box, the chat box. Let me know your assessment. Let me know your feeling of how the paper was like. Okay, number three. Consider the following trees, jackfruit, mahua, and teak. Which of the above are deciduous trees? Deciduous, fruit-bearing, fruit-bearing trees. Okay. Fruit bearing trees. Now, so look at it. Jackfruit is essentially a fruit bearing, flower bearing tree, but it's an evergreen tree. Okay? It's not a deciduous tree. Jackfruit is, in fact, an evergreen tree. It, strays, it has leaves throughout the year. Okay? Mahua? Deciduous. Yes, correct. Teak? Well, you all must be aware it is deciduous. You found it, find it south of Madhya Pradesh. Uh, Sisachalam forest being one of the pristine areas where you can find uh, teak in abundance in India. So, jackfruit is not, in fact, a deciduous tree. Jackfruit isn't, the other two are, mahua and teak, which means my answer. What would be my answer here? Well, you have again, two correct. Only two correct. Jackfruit isn't, the other two are. Yes? Which are the states where you find the maximum amount of teak? Who can tell me that in the chat? Where do you, which state in India has the maximum amount of teak that you would find? Let me know in the chat if anyone has an answer to that. I'll give you an option for that very quickly. Is it MP, is it Maharashtra or is it Karnataka? Let's see. Who can answer me that very quickly going forward? Now let's look at this question. Considering the following statements. And an India-China comparison, but not in terms of not in terms of military might or economy, but in terms of agriculture. That's where UPSC decided to test the students this year. Agriculture being the focus area for UPSC. Well, India has more arable area than China. What's the sense that you are getting here? Does India have more arable area than China? Would, would you guess that? After, after, if you were to compare just the area of the two countries, well, China has an inherent advantage. But arable area, area where you can cultivate, where you can use it for agricultural purposes. Do, does the, do the country, does the country of India have more of that than China? Well, yes, indeed. In fact, if you were to look at it, India has the most arable uh, land across the world. In the whole wide world, we have the area in terms of the most area where we can cultivate, where we can convert it into an arable land. So this is correct. The first statement is correct. Second statement, the proportion of irrigated area is more in India as compared to China. Okay. Now, if you were to do this yourself, this, this whole exercise of checking and cross-checking each and answer, each option individually, well, you will find conflicting data here. Okay. There is conflicting data, but World Bank, a report by the World Bank states that, well, irrigated area in China is higher than India. A World Bank report conclusively states that China has more irrigated area than India. 
However, some newspaper reports might tell you now. Okay, so let them let the newspapers uh, cite their sources because some newspaper reports will tell you that well, India's uh, India's uh, irrigated area is more than China. Well, you should trust those reports at your own peril. One would be best advised to follow the World Bank data, more official, right? Third one, the average productivity per hectare in Indian agriculture is higher than China. Is it indeed higher than China? Yes, options were confusing. They're meant to be confusing. Yes, Malishri, absolutely correct. The options were confusing. That's the whole point of the exam. If they were easy, well, then it wouldn't be UPSC now, would it? Huh? Yes. So who can tell me the answer for the third one? The average productivity per hectare in Indian agriculture is higher than China. Well, indeed, you should ask yourself that question first. If our agricultural productivity were higher than our China, would we be asking and begging for agricultural reforms, the systemic reforms in agriculture that you speak about? If we were so productive, why ask for reforms? If something is working well, why change it? That question ought to be asked by you when considering the statement. Obviously, doubt should cry, crop into your head. Okay, I can understand it's difficult for anyone to remember stats and figures. Understandable. Completely, I empathize with you. But then this particular statement, before you were to consider and assume it as correct, should you not ask yourself the question, if all was so green and happy with Indian agriculture, should we be asking for reforms then? Should we be taking all the policy measures to make sure that our per hectare productivity increases? So, which means essentially that China leads India when it comes to agricultural productivity, especially per hectare. Okay, that's, the, that's an incorrect statement to make. We are nowhere near, when it comes to China, we are nowhere near the agricultural productivity per hectare. We are quite below, in fact. So this is incorrect. Obviously, this is also incorrect, as said by the World Bank data. Okay. For those of you who are just joining me right now, well, newspaper reports will tell you that India's irrigated area is higher than China. Yes, I would, I would probably ask them, well, cite your sources. Because a newspaper report is not a source, World Bank data is. Which is why this is incorrect, this is incorrect, whereas this is correct. So you have only one correct out of all the three options there, which essentially means option A. Which of the above statements are correct? Yes, absolutely. Option A. Denver, how was your attempt? Let me know. How many questions did you attempt in paper one? What was it like? Did you find it difficult? Everyone, all of us who are joining us for this special live stream by Study IQ IAS English, very quickly in the chat, let me know where you are joining us from. What was the assessment of the paper? How many questions did you attempt? And then after that, probably you can estimate or guesstimate what would be the magical number, the cutoff that everyone asks. You know, people run out of the uh, exam center after the first paper is complete and the first thing on their minds is cut off kitna hoga well that can only be arrived at at least guessed at after you have analyzed your own performance vis-a-vis -vis, say the limited number of people that you know okay it's not going to be in isolation so again let us know what was your day like how was how many questions did you end up attempting after all all right which of the following is the best example of repeated falls in sea level giving rise to present-day extensive marshland. Repeated falls in sea level, and then you have a marshland that is formed there. Now, this question, I know many, many of you might, might be tempted to attempt and get it incorrect, in fact. Okay? This is going to be a difficult question. Again, if you did attempt, what was it like? Which question? Which was the answer that you finally zeroed on? Okay. First one, Bhitar Karika Mangrove. Second one, Marakanam Salt Pans, Naupada Swamp or Run of Kutch. Okay. Run of Kutch. Which one was it? Well, eventually the answer here is Run of Kutch. 
The answer here is run of Kutch. The best example, in fact, if you look worldwide, the best example of repeated falls in sea level, which eventually leads to an extensive marshland being formed. Now, what's the name of the marshland that's near run of Kutch? That's important. Sharat, what was the name of the marshland that is formed near the run of Kutch? Are you aware? Very quickly, let me know. Let, let's see. Yes? Okay. So here you have the run of Kutch being the answer. Next. Ilmenite and rutile. Abundantly available in certain coastal tracts of India are rich sources of what? What are the rich sources of? Again, a mind-bending question, I can assure you. Many people will be tempted to get this correct. Yes? Okay, we'll quickly discuss now. So when you are looking at these, ilmenite and rutile have essentially to do with heavy metals. Okay? They have essentially to do with heavy metals. And in fact, let me just write this clearly for you. It's got to do with heavy minerals, in fact. So they are to do with heavy minerals. Now, heavy minerals are of seven types. Seven heavy minerals can be, can be understood essentially. What are they? Very quickly, they are ilmenite. Then you have rutile. All right. Then you have zircon. Okay. Leucosine. Silimanate and garnet and monazite. Yes, these are our heavy minerals. Monazite, you must be aware of, extensively found across India's coastlines. Has that rung a bell in your head? You often hear of monazite being extensively found across India's coastlines, which means ilmenite and rust rutile are also found, as it says, along the coastal tracts of India. Coastal areas, are you expecting to find aluminium? Not really. That would be most unexpected if you were to find aluminium across coastal areas. Copper, no. Iron, no. Titanium, yes. Titanium is what you find across the coastal areas. Okay. Titanium is what you find which contains ilmenite and rutile. Okay, not an easy question, something that you would have to know if you were to answer this. Okay, but one way that you could have approached was the massive hint in this question was coastal tracts of India. So the geographical area has been mentioned to you. Where can you find any of these? Now, where can you find aluminium across the coastal tracts? Copper across the co coastal tracts? Not really. Where are Khetri mines? Where is copper? Iron? Again? Singboom, all of those areas, where do you find, where is coast nearby? But titanium, yes, you do know that titanium, monazite, all of these are found across the coastal tracts. So common sense would have helped you here. Again, it's not a question of mugging up as much as just looking at the question and probably figuring out your way to the answer. Okay, so titanium being the answer for ilmenite and rutile. Okay. Not an easy question, I'll give you that, but you could have reached the answer had you just paid attention to this part. This is the operative part of the question. Right? Okay. We have a sizable number of people watching. So, quickly, what were your answers? What were the ones that you chose? Let me know very quickly. Those of you who are joining us, do not hold back. This is your day to vent out. Let me know what's your opinion. Am I correct in my assessment or are you correct in your assessment? The ones that you marked, what was your thought process? Okay. How did you arrive at a particular answer? Make sure. Build on that. Let's make this interactive as possible. Okay, next. About three-fourths of the world, cobalt, CO. A metal required for EVs, essentially. You will have heard of EVs using lithium and cobalt and all of these metals and all elements that are used freely in the EV industry. 
So, where is cobalt? The maximum amount of cobalt, close to 75% of the global supply of cobalt, where is it coming from? Where is it coming from? Now, the answer to this is most hilarious. Okay? Why? Because many memes were made on this. If you are active on social media, which God, I hope you were not, but if you were, well, you must have seen that meme. Okay? Wherein a poor African kid is saying, oh, you know what, I'm working hard to dig cobalt so that you can go green, the rest of the world can go green. A dark take on the exploitation of those kids who are in the mining of cobalt. Okay? So, what is Argentina famous for? Well, lithium. Large reserves of Lithium are found in Argentina, often called the what? White gold? Is it not known as white gold there? In fact, you will see certain Argentinian policies that have been taken so as to harness their capability and the reserves of lithium. If you are following Global News, if you are following the Study IQ channel, you'd have seen many videos where this has been discussed, where Argentina was leading the way with policies, government policy, in making sure that they were able to harness their massive lithium reserves. Botswana, again, lithium, but in limited quantity. The Democratic Republic of Congo, absolutely the correct answer. In fact, Congo holds close to 79% of the global cobalt reserves. Okay? Now, like an African country with rich resources, they do lack the infrastructure to mine those resources for nat national or their own benefit, which is why the world's EV industry has now turned its attention to this tiny uh, country in the African continent, okay? So you have cobalt being mined extensively in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Kazakhstan, also known for the lithium reserves, but none of cobalt. None of cobalt, okay? That's absent in Kazakhstan. Cobalt is essentially to do with Congo, okay? Now this must have been easy, straightforward question. And you all must have been, in fact, going and looking at, uh, say, the EV industry and what's used in the EV industry, what's the policies of making sure that EV industry comes to life, the way forward. All of that has been, again, discussed comprehensively here. And so that shouldn't be an easy, it shouldn't be a difficult question for the regular watchers of this particular channel. All right, we'll move forward. Okay, which one of the following is a part of the Congo Basin? Again, please understand Congo Basin, one of the most environmentally rich areas in the whole world. The kind of species that you get in Congo Basin is unimaginable, from right from chimpanzees to uh, the most endemic of birds, reptiles, it's home to all of that. So the question asking you, which of the following countries is a part of the Congo Basin? Now the Congo Basin, again, geography students will let you, I will let you know very quickly. Congo Basin is to do with a limited number of countries only. Okay? A limited number of countries which include the first one, which will give you the answer, Cameroon, part of the Congo Basin. Then you have the Central African Republic, CAR, also part of the Congo Basin. Okay? Equatorial Guinea, part of the Congo Basin. And then Gabon, or Gabon as you will say it also part of the Congo Basin. Okay. Obviously, you will have Congo also as a part of it because it's named after it. Congo Basin, most, one of the most rich areas that you can find, again, threatened due to extensive anthropological intervention. Right? But Congo Basin includes only these countries. Obviously, Congo, which is why it's named after it. Thereafter, you have Cameroon, Central African Republic, Equatorial Guinea, and Gabon. Only these countries form a part of the Congo Basin, which means Nigeria doesn't, South Sudan doesn't, Uganda doesn't. Clear? Should be clear. So you're left with only Cameroon. Clear? Okay. Should be good enough. Here you have the answer Cameroon. Okay. Going forward. Now the following statements, okay? But once again, look at the kind of question they have asked. How many of the statements given above are correct? So no longer can you eliminate your way to the answer. That is gone out of the window. 
Okay, UPSC is bouncer to the students this year. No more elimination techniques. The guest masters, well, their game is over. You either know the statement or you don't. If you don't, well, how would you attempt the question? Because eventually, you have to factor in each option. You have to know information about each option. Okay, so the first statement now. Amar Kantak Hills are at a confluence of Vindhya and Sahyadri range. Sahyadri now. Sahyadri, you know, is to do with Western Ghats. Is to do with Western Ghats. The alternative name of Western Ghats is Sahyadri. So, Amar Kantak Hills, which are near Chotanagpur Plateau, you would know that. Yes, source of many a river in central India. North, uh, southwest of the Chotanagpur Plateau. Again, Source of many a river. Where is Western Ghats? Where is Amar Kantak Plateau? Amar Kantak Hills. So definitely they are at the confluence of not Vindhya and Sahyadri, but Vindhya and Satpura. Sahyadri would be the wrong option here. It's at the confluence of Vindhya and Satpura range. Next up, the Biligirangan hills constitute the easternmost part of Satpura range. Do they? The Biligarangan hills, you would know, are formed as the BTR hills. They are also called as the BTR hills. Okay. Just near Mysore, in fact. Just south of Mysore, probably you can reach in like an hour, hour two hours maximum, considering the roads there. Easily you can reach there. If this is near Mysore, and Satpura that I told you is in central India, well, it doesn't make sense now, does it? Yes. They cannot be any part of Satpura range, forget easternmost part or westernmost part or northernmost part or southernmost part, that doesn't matter. So, this is incorrect. This is also incorrect. Third one, Sasachalam hills constitute the southernmost part of western Ghats. Do they? Are they the southernmost part of western Ghats? You would know that by now. Sasachalam hills are along the east coast, not on the west coast. Yes, you have the Nilgiri hills there, you have all the other hills there, but not Sasachalam. Yes, which is why this is also incorrect. Which is why, which of the statements above are correct? Well, this is incorrect, this is incorrect, this is incorrect. None of the statements are correct. None of the statements being correct. Okay, and all this question asked you to do was identify Sahyadri. If, do you know the meaning of Sahyadri? Do you know where it is? What's the alternative name for Sayadri? NCRT. Okay, class 11, 12 NCRT. If you had just gone through it exhaustively, this question would have been done. I know Mega. I completely agree that this year, because the option wasn't there, you could, that whole thing of guessing your way to the correct option was gone. That's taken away from the students. Okay, but you will realize that a lot of questions can be attempted and should be attempted. Why? Because the information there is self-explanatory. Sahyadri is well-known. Satpura, well-known. Amarkantak Hills, well-known. All you need to do was identify where are they located. Are they even remotely close to each other? That's all. Okay. So you have D here being the answer. We'll move forward. Okay, now we come to the connectivity questions. The connectivity, okay. Consider India's projects and the statements. East-West Corridor and the Golden Quadrilateral connects Dibrugar and Surat. Dibrugar in Assam, Surat in Gujarat. Do you think that they are connected is what, they, what the question is asking you. Okay. Now, if you have to go on, if you have just read through East-West Corridor of the Golden Quadrilateral, you will know that it starts from Silchar in Assam. Silchar in Assam. Okay. And then it goes all the way up till Poor Bandar in Gujarat. Okay. This is, this is the whole uh, last ending points from Silchar in Assam. Again, Silcha in the news because of the Mizoram issue. 
If you haven't uh, gone through it, it's okay. It doesn't matter. We'll come to it later. But Silchar in Assam and connecting all the way west to Por Bandar in Gujarat. Now, does it connect Surat is the question. No, it doesn't. Why? Because instead it connects Rajkot. It does not connect Surat. It does not connect Dibrugar also. In fact, Silcha and then it goes via the chicken snack, the Siliguri corridor and then outwards. Dibrugar is on the top side of Assam. Okay, that doesn't happen with the East-West corridor project, which is why this is incorrect. Right, the trilateral highway, the trilateral highway, the much famed trilateral highway, most of you must have planned when you had first read about it that after the UPSC is complete, I shall take this road trip down up to Thailand going within my car. Well, that's all. You'd be driving on the trilateral highway. So, does it connect More in Manipur and Chiang Mai in Thailand? Well, obviously it goes by Myanmar, so this part is correct. But does it connect these two areas? Well, More in Manipur is correct. Yes, it does. But Chiang Mai in Thailand? No. It does not connect Chiang Mai. Which is the area that it connects in, in uh, Thailand? Who can tell me that? It's a very small town. Obviously now that road is being extended up till Bangkok. But that's again just in the uh, proposal phase. It has not been extended as such. And it definitely does not go via Chiang Mai. Okay. You have to understand this. It's factual. But it's expected of you to at least know maps. And not just maps of rivers and rivulets and hills and plateaus, but actual highways. What are the roads they go through? Waterways? What are the cities they traverse? You have to know that. At least have a fair idea of where that road leads. Okay? So you're looking at this. So this goes to Mysot. This is in Thailand. It does not go to Chiang Mai. It goes to my south. Okay. Third one. The Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar economic corridor. Does it connect Varanasi in Uttar Pradesh to Kunming in China? In fact, if you just go back and read about it, this whole economic corridor came due to something called the Kunming Initiative. Okay. The Kunming Initiative. This was what started this project. This started basically during the Manmohan Singh era. Okay. But this was the name of the initiative that led to this particular Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar project. So which means this part is correct. But does it connect Varanasi? Now what I want you to do is just even if you do not know, even if you do not know, I give it to you that you have no idea. Please understand, this is a project that, ha that you haven't heard a lot of information for a long time. Okay. In fact, it has taken a secondary step to the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative of China. I just told you that this was conceived, this was operationalized, or this was at least uh, put forward during the Manmohan Singh era. With that information, now a rash rationality, an element of rationality has to be introduced here. Can you tell me one good reason why Varanasi would be given preference in the Manmohan Singh era? You see all the development in Varanasi, all the project consolidation that has happened there has happened after the current Prime Minister was elected in 2014. Varanasi didn't exist on a mind maps, at least in the sense of current affairs and this kind of things before that. Straight up. So you have to understand Varanasi is not the one that has been connected. In fact, Bangladesh, please realize from where is Bangladesh and where is Varanasi, okay? Would, would we completely overlook the whole Gangetic plain in the middle, coming in the middle? You wouldn't, which means if Bangladesh is there, the obvious guess would be that probably Kolkata is the one that would be nearest in terms of an entry point, a major, uh, major Indian city that would be linked. The whole point of it is to link big cities so that you can have seamless exchange of uh, not just say economy but also transport, ideas, people, everything. Right? Varanasi wouldn't be, even it wouldn't be an option also. 
which is why Varanasi is incorrect. Kolkata is in fact the one that is to be co connected to Kunming and that would happen through the BCIN corridor, the BCIN, the Bangladesh-China-India-Myanmar economic corridor that would essentially serve to link Kunming in China, thereafter Kolkata in India, through Bangladesh and Myanmar. Now would it connect Dhaka? Go ahead and have a look. Have a look. Would it connect Dhaka? What would your understanding be? What would your common sense tell you? Should Dhaka be a part of this? If you were designing a project of this magnitude, would you overlook Dhaka? Have a look. This is how you are going to approach questions to which you do not know. You have to think from a macro perspective. You have to think from a chronological perspective. Places that are in the news now weren't in the news, say, seven, eight years ago in terms of policy prescriptions. Okay? Going forward. All right. So consider the following statements. India, despite having uranium deposits, depends on coal for most of its electricity production. Uranium enriched to the extent of at least 60% is required for the production of electricity. This must be an easy one. This must not be very difficult for you to answer. Probably the first one you would have understood for, by now. That would be the more uh, easier one for you to guess. Yes? So where is uranium found in India again? Singbum, Hazaribagh, these are the areas where you will hope to find, in fact you do find uranium, right? So you find uranium in Singbum, you find uranium extensively in Hazaribagh, okay? Mines exist there where we mine uranium for our own needs, okay? So we do have uranium deposits, yes, that first statement is correct. First part of the first statement is correct. Depends on coal for most of its electricity production. Yes, that is correct. Obviously, a renewed thrust is being given on say renewable energy. But then as of now, our power generation is driven by coal mechanisms. Yes, thermal power plants are the ones that do it. So this is correct. Absolutely. Second one. Uranium enriched to the extent of at least 60% is required for the production of electricity. Now you should ask yourself this question, what, what type? What type of production are we talking about? What's exactly are that we are hinting at? Okay, and is it the correct uh, explanation for this? Is it the correct explanation first? Okay. Does the fact that you've enriched your uranium to 60%, is it because, well, is that the cause there? The cause-effect relationship has to be drawn here. Are you able to draw that correlation firstly, is what you have to ask yourself. How are you going to draw that correlation? That uranium enriched to 60% is required for the production of electricity, which is why we are dependent on coal for most of its electricity production. It doesn't make sense. Okay, it does not make sense. And again, at 60%, when you enrich uranium to that high an extent, in fact, if you look at Iran, now Iran, the whole Western sanctions, the whole has, it has come, why? Because Iran enriched beyond the mandate of 3.75%. That is what the Western countries had asked Iran to do. Iran went ahead and did much higher than that. So obviously, sanctions. What does that tell you? That it could be, and it is used for military purposes. At 60%, at 90% of enrichment, you are looking at military uses. Electricity uses happen much below this threshold, much below this threshold. And it is not required. Please understand this. Uranium is not required to be enriched to that high an extent just to produce electricity. That does not happen. It's, it's required at that particular enrichment for military purposes only. Which means this statement is incorrect. Absolutely incorrect statement. Okay. So you are left with what? If the statement 1 is correct, statement 2 is incorrect. So yes, here is the answer. C. C will be my answer. Okay. Please understand the level of enrichment is to do with military connotations. It has military uses. Like I told you, 
Iran went above just this threshold and they were sanctioned. So do you think that India will enrich till 60% and then claim that we are doing it for electricity? No. Okay. So C is the answer here. Moving forward. All right, consider the following statements. Number one, marsupials are not naturally found in India. What are marsupials? The ones that carry their offspring in pouches. Yes, that's a marsupial. So, kangaroo would be a marsupial. Okay. Number two, marsupials can thrive only in montane grasslands with no predators. No predators. Imagine that. A, a system an ecological system, a food system, a food chain, where there are no predators. How would that be? Then you would probably have overpopulation of marsupials. Yeah? So, would this be a necessary condition? Common sense will tell you that a, a marsupial, or forget marsupial, any animal cannot exist without being usurped or without being one-up, one-topped by some other animal. That's unheard of. Probably the primary predator is the only one who has no, no one above him or her in that food chain. Marsupials, they are not primary predators. They are not primary con uh, the primary predators in an ecosystem, in a food chain. So how will that be? So this statement is incorrect, clearly. The fact that the statement says no predators, plus at the same time, when you look at where marsupials are found, so Australia New Zealand would probably be the first of your uh, guesses. Australia does not have montane grasslands. It just has grasslands. It has grasslands. Okay. It has uh, the great outback there. So it has desert. Right. Montane grasslands? No, not really. Montane grasslands are not the ones where marsupials are supported, which means your answer here is, well, obviously this is correct. They are not naturally found in India. You don't find any kangaroos roaming around in our jungles. Which means the answer is C. Not a very difficult question if you were just to apply your common sense. Not a very difficult question. Not at all, in fact. Marsupials, it's well known. You have well, you would have studied about uh, montane forests and this, this particular part with no predators. You should just straight away ask yourself this question. How is that even possible? How is that even possible? How can that be that there would be no predators required for a marsupial to thrive? Can that even exist is what you should ask yourself first. Okay. Next, we'll move on to the next question. All right. Invasive species specialist group that develops the global invasive species database, the GISD. So who prepares it? Who does, which particular organization prepares the GISD? All right. The IUCN, the UNEP for Environment and Development, the World Wildlife Fund for Nature. This will be an easy question because again, I know most of you would have done international organizations, reports that are produced, indexes that are produced. That's a common area where students target and thankfully to your benefit, a question has been asked from there. In fact, this question could probably be categorized as a low-hanging fruit, in fact. Why? Because this is a factual question, straight up. It wouldn't take you more than 35-40 seconds to attempt this question and move on if you know the answer. The obvious answer here being IUCN. IUCN is the one that releases the GIST, the Global Invasive Species Database. It talks about alien species, invasive species, their effects that, it, that, that exist, all of that is discussed threadbare in the GISD report. Okay. There is another report that is uh, being released by the IUCN that is in the works. Okay. So from your mains perspective, if you really want to be fully informed of what the IUCN is doing in the days to come, well, IUCN is going to be releasing a global register. Okay. A global register of introduced and invasive species. So from your mains perspective, one thing that you could probably revise, have a look at. This is in the works. The global register is in the works. The GISD, the Global Invasive Species Database, 
that maintains the whole list of any alien or any invasive species, okay, that is done by the IUCN. Clear cut answer, not much vagueness here, okay, next one. All right, consider the following fauna, the lion-tailed macaque, malabar civet, sambar deer. Which of the above are generally nocturnal or most active after sunset? So there are two parts of this question, guys. Please understand before you attempt it. There are two parts of that question. How many of the above are generally nocturnal? Part one or two are most active. Okay, this is the second part. Okay, number one, lion-tailed macaque. Where is it found? Endemic to which part of India? Where is it? Uh, uh, where is it found in India? How many can tell me that? Very quickly. So, lion-tailed macaque and old-world monkey. You must have heard of this term, an old-world monkey. Okay. Yes, Western Ghats, endemic to that area and they are diurnal. What does diurnal mean? That they are active both during daytime as well as during night time. Okay. So, lion tail macaque can't be my answer here. B, Malabar civet, yes, a nocturnal animal. Sambar deer, well, it is a nocturnal animal. It prefers to be in the shade during afternoons. During hot afternoons, it will be chilling under the shade. At night, it comes out for foraging, for whatever purpose. So you have the Malabar civet and the Sambar deer that are nocturnal, which means your answer is 2. B. Straightforward answer here. Okay. Moving forward. Which of the following organisms perform the waggle dance? What's the waggle dance, guys? The dance where a figure of eight is formed. If you have a hive here, if this is the hive, well, the organism, the, the particular organism, whichever one we have to choose, comes and dances like this. Which, which uh, insect does this? Which, which one does this out of them? Butterflies? Do they go ahead in this? You must have been to a, a garden or any time. If you have seen a butterfly, do they make a figure of eight? No, they don't. In fact, they have most random way of flying. So no, butterflies can't be doing the wagon dance. Dragonflies, no. Wasps, not at all. Honeybees, yes. And please understand your hint here. The direction and distance to a source of their food. Distance and direction. Now, you must have heard of all these electromagnetic radiation uh, affecting the honeybees and they lose their direction, their sense of direction. They go out in search of food and then they get affected by the rays and then they're unable to get back home to the hive. Which means that the figure of eight is done by the honeybees. The waggle dance is done by the honeybees. Okay. This was again, if common sense, not very difficult. Clear? Again, how many of you are watching this? Whoever is watching this, whoever is, let me know very quickly. What's your assessment of the paper? Paper 1 is what we are discussing right now. Geography is what we have started with. Polity will follow immediately after and thereafter the whole subjects will follow. Next one. So consider the following statements. Some mushrooms have medicinal properties. Some mushrooms have psychoactive properties. Some mushrooms have insecticidal properties and some are bi bioluminescent, which means they glow under the dark. Okay, so look at it now. Firstly, some, 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 which means just even if there is one or two, it's enough for you to answer this question. Medicinal properties, yes. Psychoactive properties, you must have heard of magic mushrooms. Okay, magic mushrooms are there, which are used freely by those who consume it. Okay, it has uh, psychotropic effects close to what LSD is probably. Okay, C, insecticidal and bioluminescent. Yes, there exist these kind of fungi, these kind of mushrooms that glow under the dark or they do repel in, uh, insects. 
they have insecticidal properties extensive research has been carried out in fact all right the names if you want to have a look at the names i'll very quickly give you the names of uh, these so the insecticidal ones is lactarius fuligorosus psychoactive psilobin mushroom and then armillaria malaria which is medicinal so you have certain varieties of mushrooms that have all of these characteristics medicinal psychotropic insecticidal and bioluminescent all right so your answer here is which of the above statements are correct indeed all of them are correct d being my answer clear we'll move forward so consider the following regarding indian squirrels indian squirrels they build nests by making burrows in the ground well they don't in fact they live on trees indian squirrels live on trees they in fact hibernate on trees too okay they store their food materials like nuts and seeds in the ground no if they're living on trees why would they store their nuts and seeds in the ground they don't they're omnivorous yes they eat nuts they consume fruits okay small mammals can be eaten by them at the same time you can have insects that are eaten by them and reptiles all of these are consumed by the indian squirrel which means it is omnivorous okay it eats both kind plant and meat so you have just one correct a a being the answer to this clear moving forward some microorganisms can grow in environments with temperature above the boiling point of water above the boiling point of water and some so even if two or three kind of microorganisms exist well the statement is true so if you have studied chemistry if you have studied in fact physical science and if you have gone through ncrts the ncrts mention a very specific kind guys yes so you have what is known as the thermophilic bacteria thermo to do with heat fill to do with love so bacteria that loves heat so you have bacteria that stay up to 110 degree centigrade they can stay alive up till that and grow and fledge in that environment so yes statement 1 is correct statement 2 can grow in environment with temperature below the freezing point of water well all the permafrost will contain perma bacteria so yes they do exist they do grow there all right some microorganisms can grow in uh, highly acidic environments with ph below 3 if you have achar in your house pickle if you have pickle at your homes okay its uh, 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 ph value will be uh, lesser than 3 or around 3 or lesser than 3 so you have these particular environments that are created where bacteria thrives and survives in fact multiplies and which is what it's asking can it grow there rather than just surviving yes it can correct all three are correct which means c being the answer you have particular areas you have particular environments where bacteria survives in fact it's called the most sturdy hardy of all microorganisms in the most inhospitable of conditions the bacteria is able to survive and thrive okay no moving forward which of the following makes a tool with a stick to scrape insects from a hole in a tree or a log of wood it's asking about usage of tools animals using tools which means even if you do not know all of this you should know that their mental evolution is such that they have started using tools how many animals can do use tools elephants do they use large leaves to swat flies across their leaves but it's asking me about a stick it's asking me about a particular stick so your hint is there that an animal which can use tools with hands can fishing cat do it no otter definitely not sloth bear why how would it orangutan the same class the same family as as say what we belong to yes just we have evolved they haven't evolved but they're well able to use sticks twigs as tools lesser in the evolutionary arc 
but still able to get there. Common sense. You see Planet of the Apes movie and this movie and that movie where chimpanzees are using guns. Well, you have orangutans using sticks. Why? For their food. Common sense again. Not, you don't require to be extremely super intelligent to answer this question. Okay. Next one. Consider the following. In which of the following above, uh, which of, uh, in the making of, okay. You are asking about the making of above, do you use hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs? Where are the HFCs used? Aerosols? Well, of course, aerosols have HFCs, suspended particles. Massive amount of HFCs is concerned there. Foam agents, yes, because they help in the foaming. The foaming is there, that, that attribute comes from HFCs. Fire retardants, yes. Lubricants, yes. All of these places is where HFCs are freely used. Hydrofluorocarbons, freely used. Which means all four are correct. You have D as your answer here. All of them. You use everywhere. Freely you use it. Which is why you see that there is a lot of restriction. You know, prohibition is coming in, in these areas. That you should have uh, sustainable models to use this. That the current ones are polluting. Okay. Many articles on Down to Earth and Nature magazine and this magazine, that magazine. Host of articles. So again, if you have been up to date with current affairs, shouldn't be very difficult this question. Again, going forward. Okay, 23. Carbon markets are likely to be one of the most widespread tools in the fight against climate change. Carbon markets. You've heard about carbon offsetting, carbon setting, carbon credits. All of that is a part of the carbon market. So, are they being going to be the most widespread tool in the fight against climate change? The statement too. Carbon markets transfer resources from private sector to the state. Do they transfer from private sector to the state? Huh? Is that to do with carbon markets? Or is it to do with one entity to the other? Entity 1 to entity 2. Now, it could be a country, an institution, a company, whatever. But that provision is allowed for you. So, it's not to do with the pri private sector and the public sector insofar as, say, the transnational boundary. That within the boundary of this country, I send to some other country. So, I claim carbon credit. So, which means this statement is incorrect. This statement is correct. So, I'm left with what? See here. Statement 1 is correct. Statement 2 is completely wholesomely, without any ambiguity, incorrect. Okay, moving forward. Again, those of you who are just joining me, very quickly I'll tell you, this is the geography analysis straight after this. In this very stream, after we finish the geography questions, I will have one of my esteemed colleagues come and discuss the polity questions. So make sure that you stay tuned in as we will be taking a look at each and every question that you have solved 9.30 to 11.30 earlier today. Okay, next one we look at community reserve. Now, once the central government notifies an area as community reserve, what happens? Number one, the chief wildlife warden, basically the PCCF of the state, the principal chief conservator of the state, he becomes the governing authority of such forest. Does he now? Does he? Does one person become the governing authority? Huh? One Indian Forest Service officer, probably in the apex pay scale, prime of his uh, service life, going to retire in a few months, he becomes the governing authority of such a state. Two, hunting is not allowed in such area, correct? Hunting is anyways not allowed anywhere. So, correct. People of such area are allowed to collect non-timber forest produce. Non-timber forest produce such as leaves. If you go to South Bengal, you find that they use the leaves of salt tree as plates. In the evening, if you have to take a bicycle and go around the forest of South Bengal, you will see people coming back with massive amount of sal, dried sal leaves on their shoulders. It's a what? What is it? It's a non-timber forest produce that they are allowed to co collect for their living, for their sustenance. Absolutely correct. People of such area are allowed traditional agricultural practices. Does jham cultivation come as a part of traditional agricultural practices? You should ask yourself that question first. Is jhuming allowed? 
in community reserves would would that be allowed you should ask yourself that first because what it essentially it is a traditional farming practice right so are they allowed traditional agricultural practices this is correct so which means you have three correct here okay clear moving forward with reference to the role of biofilters in recirculating aquaculture consider the following statements so we are talking about biofilters now biofilters provide waste treatment by removing uneaten fish feed number 2 biofilters convert ammonia present in fish waste to nitrate yes they do that they increase phosphorus as nutrient for fish and water well they don't one and two are correct which means only two statements are correct only two statements being correct for biofilters okay again a new concept biofilters that has been extensively discussed on this channel we have had several presentations where we have discussed what are biofilters what are their role what's the role that they do what's the problem that you know uh, you anticipate vis-a-vis -vis biofilters in the coming days all of that being discussed on study iq ias next one gold mining activity is a source of mercury pollution in the world in fact gold mining is the most major source of mercury pollution in the world the most major source okay in the formation of amal in fact when you look at it you have gold mining that has the maximum contribution to mercury pollution so this is correct coal based thermal power plants cause mercury pollution well yes coal based power plants give us the vapor the mercury induced vapor which can cause rainwater which can cause acid rain rainwater to be contaminated water sources around that particular area to be contaminated so all of those issues exist with coal water coal based thermal power plants so correct there is no known safe level for exposure to mercury absolutely correct okay absolutely correct in fact what is said is that you should avoid exposure more than this particular limit however this is to be bear in, borne in mind as not the maximum limit or the minimum limit okay ideally you should have no exposure to mercury because the moment you expose yourself to mercury then the ailments the side effects they are deep rooted in fact they can go up to generations is what is said which is why no exposure to mercury is desired not even a little bit not even 0.01% so this is correct so you have all of the statements being correct here see all right we'll move forward with reference to the earth's atmosphere which one of the following statements is correct number 1 the total amount of insulation incoming solar radiation that's insulation you must have extensively heard of this term received at the equator is 10 times that received at the poles you would know by now that the maximum amount of insulation is near the tropics 23 and 1/2 degree north 23 and 1/2 degree south that's where you get the maximum incoming solar radiation the equator does not have as high as tropics why cloud coverage okay cloud cover is there so you, you the rain the solar radiation is blocked okay poles it reduces in fact if you look at it 320 watts per meter cube is the number that we are looking at okay at the tropics and at the poles this number comes down to 70 watt per meter cube okay now this is at the tropics and i told you that the insulation at equator is lesser than the tropics so even if you were to assume it as say 250 would it be 10 times that of this no ways 10 times this of this is not even found at the tropics incorrect infrared infrared rays constitute nearly 2/3 of insulation well they do not 2/3 is roughly 60% is what you are looking at no they do not 
Insulation in uh, infrared is to do maximum. In fact, with uh, infrared is 40%. Okay. Then after the visible is at 50%. And then the ultraviolet rays are at 10%. That's the breakup. So, this is correct, incorrect. Infrared rays are largely absorbed by water vapor that is concentrated in the lower atmosphere. Absolutely correct. Infrared waves are part of the visible spectrum. If they were part of the visible spectrum, they wouldn't be called infrared rays. Right? So, this is incorrect. Which means C is the one. The infrared rays are the ones that are absorbed by water vapor. Okay? As they go, uh, uh, hit the surface of the earth and then they have to go back, well, absorbed by water vapor. Or before hitting the surface of the earth, absorbed by water vapor. That exists in the lower atmosphere. Clear? Moving forward. Consider the following statement. Soil in tropical rainforests is rich in nutrients. Is it rich in nutrients? What happens there in the tropical rainforest? You have extensive rainfall. Large rainfall, amount of, large amount of rainfall is there. So, eventually at the soil, all of this rainfall percolates. A large amount of nutrients are washed away. They are washed away due to extensive rainfall. Number two, the high temperature and moisture of tropical rainforest cause dead organic matter in the soil to decompose quickly. Absolutely correct. The decomposition here is fast, but then the soil is not able to retain all the nutrients. Why? Because extensive rainfall, continuous rainfall. So, soil leaching happens. The leaching of the soil is what is observed. Once this has happened, well, you are going to lose all your nutrients. The quality and the quantity of the nutrients that the soil can hold in itself is severely compromised. Okay, so this can't be my answer, which means I am left with what? Well, this is an incorrect answer. This is an incorrect answer for sure. It is not rich in nutrients and it decomposes quickly. So, this is correct, which means my answer is incorrect and correct. D. Absolutely. D being the answer here. Clear? Going forward. The temperature contrast between continents and oceans is greater during summer than in winter. This straightforward question from NCRT, not much to explain here. The specific heat of water is more than that of land surface, absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. But the temperature contrast, that is incorrect. Okay. It's not greater during summer than in winter. Okay. So straight, there's not much to explain here again. Because the specific heat, the land, the sea warms up slowly and cools off slowly. Its specific heat is higher than that of land, which is why it's able to do it. Which means statement 1 is incorrect, statement 2 is correct. This is an incorrect statement. The temperature cont contrast during sea and land is not higher during uh, uh, the summers than in winters. In fact, contrary to it. Okay, next. Again, straightforward question from the NCRT. In a seismograph, P waves are recorded earlier than S waves. Yes, absolutely. P waves do come before S waves. Okay. P waves, the individual particles vibrate to and fro in the direction of wave propagation. S waves up and down. Why? Because P waves are parallel to the wave, whereas S waves are at a right angle to the wave which is why they are to and fro. S waves are up and down at right angles. Yes, quite clear. This is not a very difficult question to answer. Again, basics of NCRT. NCRT 11 is what you should know if you are to solve this question in the first go without, you know, losing your hair, which means your answer is C. Why? Only because you need to know is this. How do the P waves move in relation to the earthquake wave, the wave of the earthquake? Well, parallel, parallel to it. S waves hitting it 90 degree, parallel to the plane of the wave. That's all you need to know. Not very difficult. C. Next. Coal-based thermal power plant in India. Consider the following statements. None of them use seawater. Why wouldn't they use seawater if it was available? First, you should ask that. 
Don't we know of a procedure called desalinization? Don't we know of this process called desalinization? Right? So, in fact, you have the Mundra pot. Sorry, uh, you have a particular, I'll tell you the answer to this. You have the Mundra coal power plant. Yes, the Mundra coal power plant, which essentially uses desalinized seawater to create electricity. None of them is set up in water stressed districts. None of them. Really? None of them is privately owned. Well, this is in fact privately owned. And there are at least half of these thermal power plants, 50% of them are set up in water stress districts. So you have this incorrect, this incorrect, this incorrect. None of the statements are correct. D, D being the answer. Okay. And you should straight away ask these extreme words, none, none, how can it be possible? How can it be possible that state controls everything in the country, especially when it comes to power generation? Right? Next. Volbachia method. What is the Volbachia method? Straightforward, it is to do with controlling the viral diseases spread by mosquitoes, especially when you look at dengue. The dengue. Okay? Through this particular method, in Aedes aegypti, okay? In Aedes aegypti, So, the tendency of Aegis, Aedes aegypti to spread dengue can be hindered through introduction of this method, the Volbachia method. Alright, next one. Consider the following activities. Spreading finely ground basalt stock or rock on farmlands extensively, increasing the alkanity of oceans, capturing carbon dioxide released by industries and pumping it into an abandoned subterranean mine. How many of the above activities? are carbon capture and sequestration. How many of them? Well, if you spend basalt, what happens? Correct. Alkanity of oceans, correct. Okay. You are increasing the ability of the ocean to act as a carbon sink is what you are doing. Okay. In fact, you would have heard of oceans turning acidic and which is why you probably lose the ability as of the oceans to be acting as a carbon sink. Yes, correct. This is obviously, we know of what carbon sinks are. So, all three are essentially the answer here, C being the answer for this. Next one. Now we come to the World Water Developmental Report for the year 2022. Now what does it say? India extracts more than a quarter of the world's groundwater withdrawal each year. So yes, close to 25% is what India extracts. And then it says it extracts, why? Because it needs for drinking water and sanitation. Well, no. In fact, it also needs for agriculture, guys. It's not just to do with drinking water and sanitation, which is why it's 25%. Right? So your answer here is statement 1 is correct, 2 is incorrect. Why? Because the agricultural connotation is missing here. Okay? That's not there. Next one. Consider the following statements. In India, the Biodiversity Management Committee are key to the realization of the objectives of the Nagoya Protocol. Yes, the BMC looks after the Nagoya Protocol. Absolutely. And this committee has important function in determining access and benefit sharing, including the power to levy collection fees on biological resources within its jurisdiction. The operative line here. That within its jurisdiction, it has the power of taxation. Yes, it can do that. It can levy taxes. So you have both the options correct here. See. Absolutely. Straightforward. Next one. Consider the following heavy industries, fertilizer, oil refinery, steel plant, green hydrogen, wherein you split hyd water into hydrogen plus oxygen using renewable energy or renewable electricity. Green hydrogen, massive part of this year's budget. So, where can it be used? Fertilizer plants, yes, the finance minister said it was going to be green hydrogen, was going to find uh, usage right from fuel cells. To fertilize the plants is her exact quote, in fact, which means oil refineries, steel plants, all of them is where green hydrogen will find usage. Why? Because it's essentially to do with this breakdown of water. Correct. All C. C is correct. Again, green hydrogen asked an expected question, not really very difficult in so far as this is concerned. All right. With that, my dear students, we come to the end of the geography series. All right. And now I will hand over to my colleague,
who will be taking you forward with the next series. Do make sure to tune in and keep uh, watching this uh, particular live stream. I will be back later with the Seaside Solution, sir. Hi, sir. was the exam? One second. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All the best. Sir. So, how was the exam? So, first of all, uh, please increase the watchings. Please share it with your friends. Please do share it with your friends, first of all. And uh, let me start with the current affairs section. Okay. And... Uh, uh, just I am going to start with the current affairs section. How much cut off, cut off uh, you are expecting? How much cut off you all are expecting? Tell me. Actually, we are getting so much mails or so much questions as. Uh, uh, that cut off, how much should be the cut off. So, I think uh, uh, if you are scoring 80, approximate 80 marks, so you have to start uh, preparing for the mains and 85 plus minus 5 we are expecting. Okay. So, what's your score? And please do share it with your friends so that few more uh, guys can join and uh, we can actually enjoy the session. Right. Just wait, I am going to open the current affairs section. Quality, it's quality, history, science and tech, economy, where is the current affairs? Yeah. Uh, hi. So actually, there are many questions from the current affairs section. Uh, there are many questions, but we will discuss. We will discuss the questions which are directly from the current affairs, exclusively from the current affairs, because there are many questions which are linked from the environment section as well as the economy sections. But we will here discuss only those questions which are directly from the current affairs and without wasting your time, I will directly start the question and question number 57, please. What is the answer? You first tell me the answer. Which one of the following countries has its own satellite navigation system? Tell me the answer. It's Australia, Canada, Israel, yeah, Japan. So tell me the answer. Try try to answer the question. Megha, Mauli, please answer the question. And do share it with your friends. So the answer is Japan. Okay. And QZSS, that is Quasi Zenith Satellite System of Japan. Hai na? QZSS, okay, and Australia, Australia, Canada, and Israel does not have the Australia, Canada, Israel does not have the their own navigation, uh, their own satellite navigation system, okay. Uh, Sumit, maybe Canada? No, it's not Canada. It's Japan. Okay, so uh, let's let's go for the next question. The D is the answer. And the next one is, which one of the following countries has been suffering from decades of the civil strife and the food shortage? Okay, civil strife and the food shortage. So, the main catch is both the two because Angola, Costa Rica, Ecuador and the Somalia, all are the countries which are suffering from the food shortage. But because of this keyword, civil strife and the food, food shortage, the answer will be Somalia. The answer will be Somalia. Okay. The answer will be Somalia. 
the answer will be Somalia. Okay, and uh, you know uh, the in all uh, drought like situation was there. Drought like situation was there in where in the Horn of Africa. Horn of Africa, and uh, and if we talk about the Horn of Africa, it means I'm talking about the seed. Seed means Somalia, Eritrea, uh, Ethiopia, and Djibouti. Okay, you know this fact or not? This is the code for the Horn of Africa. Seed. Okay. Uh, kingdom. Okay, nice, nice. Uh, yes, it's D, Somalia. It's correct. Okay. So, uh, let's move to the next one. And the next question. Next question is, this one is little bit tricky one. Okay, it's it's a tricky one. First of all, you have to answer, then only I, I'll give the answer. The Question is, consider the following statement and first one is, Switzerland is one of the leading exporter of gold in terms of value. If we talk about the value, it's saying that it's a leading exporter of gold. So, it, this statement is correct one because if we talk about this Switzerland, if we talk about the Switzerland in 2021, in 2021 report, the Switzerland exported approximately uh, 86.78 billion dollar gold okay 86.78 billion dollar gold and uh, making it the first in number okay and the second statement switzerland has the second largest gold reserves in the world if we talk about the gold reserves then no it's not uh, again explain the seed seed okay it, if we talk about the horn of africa so just go and look at the map okay what all countries makes the Horn of Africa? Horn of Africa means Somalia, Eritrea, Ethiopia and Djibouti. Okay. Djibouti spelling starts from D. Na. So, that's why seed. It's a shortcut for the Horn of Africa. Okay. Uh, now, tell me this one. So, this statement is correct and the second one is incorrect because it's saying the Switzerland has the second largest gold reserves in the world. No, it's not because the first one is US and second one is Germany. Okay, so first one is US and second one is Germany. So, it, this one is wrong. So, it means only one. So, both statement, yeah, if we talk about the C and D, so here statement one is correct. Statement one is correct, but statement two is incorrect means answer should be C. Answer should be C, uh, C. Yes. C should be the answer. Okay. Now, next one. So, next one. This again a tricky question. If you go uh, to the Google and ask the data, you will not able to find. So, we have got some data in which we uh, we can link with this question because it's not written that for which year it is talking about. Okay, the question is consider the following statement and you have to answer the question first. Tell me the India accounts for the 3.2 percent of the global export of goods. Uh, what's your answer in this question? What you have marked? Tell me what you have marked. India accounts for 3.2 percent of global export in of good. See, we are considering the it wrong statement because India accounts for 3.2 if we talk about its 18 2018 data as per this data uh, 3.2 percent of um, 3.2 percent of import and 3.5 percent of export okay so that is why this statement is wrong and another one the main thing which because of which this statement can make you confuse the reason is ki many local companies and some foreign companies this foreign world can make you little bit confused but yes it is correct that local companies as well as the foreign companies both operating in india can take the advantage of plis production linked incentive what is production linked incentive it means that all that incentive which is provided by the government of India so that the production level can be enhanced. Okay, the production level can be enhanced in the domestic as well as those companies which are the foreign based companies but which are operating in our territory. Okay, so this one again is correct. So, it means the second statement is correct. Second statement is 
correct and the first one is incorrect it means d should be the answer okay d should be the answer now so now tell me see consider the following pairs with regard to the sports award it's a simple question hai na major dhyan chandra khel ratna award what is this rajiv gandhi khel ratna award okay uh, what you have marked tell me again the watching uh, comes little lower please do share it with your friends for the most uh, spectacular and outstanding performance by the sports person over period of last 4 years last 4 years if we talk about last 4 years it's about the arjun award and the major dhyan chand means for the lifetime for the lifetime achievement of a sports person and uh, dronachar award is for the coaches okay it's for the coaches and the rashtriya khel protsahan uh, award ओके राष्ट्रीय खेल प्रोत्साहन टू रिकॉग्नाइज द कंट्रीब्यूशन मेड बाय द स्पोर्ट्स पर्सन इवन आफ्टर द रिटायरमेंट दिस रिटायरमेंट वर्ड शुड नॉट बी देयर सो इट मींस इट इज रॉन्ग सो ओनली टू स्टेटमेंट्स आर करेक्ट सो इट मींस बी शुड बी द आंसर बी शुड बी द आंसर एंड द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज From the forty fourth Chess Olympiad, twenty twenty two. Okay, forty fourth Chess Olympiad, twenty twenty two. It was the first time that the Chess Olympiad was held in India. Yes, it is correct, and it was held in Chennai. Okay, so this was correct. This it's a correct one. So it's a correct one. Okay, the official mascot was named Thambi. Thambi means brotherhood. brotherhood and this one is again correct the trophy for the winning team in the open section open section is the veera manchik cup and the trophy for the winning cup for the women section is hamilton russell cup okay this is interchanged for the women section it is veera manchik and the open section it is hamilton russell okay so these two are incorrect and first and second is correct means two statements are correct so answer should be b okay so answer is b so yes yes it's b okay so uh, now the next teacher will discuss about the polity section or uh, his own section and you tell me ki how much you have make the correct answers let's talk about the current affairs section only or uh, uh, current affairs and the environment and geography is also been discussed till now how many questions you all have made correct tell me tell me megha mauli how many questions till you all have made correct how many questions you have made correct tell me okay now babu sir is here with us we who will discuss the polity sections with you all the questions comes from the polity he will discuss uh i will give my attempt in 2024 yes you are most welcome we are always here to help you out in this section and uh, this portion uh now the polity portion will be taken by the babu sir and he is here sir please come welcome sir sir i'll carry it forward uh, from the current affairs section
So, I will take up the discussion of Indian Okay, now we will continue with the section that is Indian polity and governance as a continuation of the discussion that you have had. So, before I uh, get into the discussion of the polity section of the prelims 2023, few observations from my side, the kind of observations. First of all, the general observations, if you see the general observation, one I felt is the question has been very lengthy in comparison to the previous years. It has been a bit lengthy paper. So, this is a news that the students who are going to prepare for civil service examination that they should realize that they should be very fast in reading the questions. Second, there has been a, a reverse in the trend of questions that has been asked, although most of the section has been the same, but if you see the geography, there is a huge jump in the number of questions that has been asked in geography. So, you should always uh, 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 ready for something which is unexpected when it comes to UPSC examination. Third observation that I could also feel is that there is a lot of uh, questions from the government schemes and all those things. So, that is another area. And most importantly, UPSC has changed the way that they set the options and the students who does not have any uh, experience of solving this kind of options, they have suddenly changed the options uh, and it is very important that students should take note of how the options are also being asked because we go with a prejudice mindset as to how it has been happening in the recent past. So, that is also very important that you should be very careful of each and every word that is given when you appear for the examination. And when now it can when it comes to polity specifically, you will understand that in polity also there are few changes. Probably there are not much questions from fundamental rights and the conventional areas. And also they have focused upon areas which is unconventional. They have gone beyond the constitution. They have asked questions from the Indian Evidence Act, Official Secrets Act. They have asked from the Prisons Act. So there are certain unconventional questions also. But more or less the in terms of weightage. There are around 50 questions in polity, we will just continue with the uh, questions. So, we will just proceed to the, the polity section of the, the questions. So, just uh, give me a moment.
Okay, sorry for the inconvenience, there was a technical glitch. So, let us just proceed with the discussion of the first question. That is question number for polity. <coughs> So, we will just go with the first question for polity that is article 31 of the constitution. In essence, what is this due process of law means? So, basically the question is asking what in essence is the due process of law? Just uh, give me a moment. So there's a, a technical issue. Just, just, just give us a moment. Okay. So, the first question in polity is uh, question number 31. So, look into this particular question. So, what is this question is asking about? The question is asking about in essence what is what does the due process of law means. So due process of law and procedure established by law we know that it is a very important concept but this question is focusing upon what is called as the due process of law. We know that article 21 of the constitution provides for what is called as that the right to life and liberty but that right to life and liberty is not absolute. It can be restricted and it can be restricted in accordance with the procedure established by law. That is what is given in the original constitution. But in the Menaga Gandhi case, in the Menaga Gandhi case, in the year 1978, the Supreme Court made it very clear that the expression procedure established by law would have the same meaning as that of due process of law. But however, if you see this due process of law, the due process of law can be further divided into what is called as the procedural due process, procedural due process and substantive due process and substantive due process. While the procedural due process, has, the due process says that, uh, that any law which provides for a certain procedure, that procedure should be fair, just and reasonable. The procedure based on which the right to life and liberty of an individual can be deprived, that procedure should be fair, just and reasonable. Whereas the substantive due process of law says that the law itself should be fair, just and reasonable. And if you look into this particular question, this particular question is more relevant to the concept of what is called as procedural due process. It is not talking much about the substantive due process because when you talk of the procedural due process, please understand, it says that if an individual's right to life and liberty is to be deprived, then the individual should be given a sufficient opportunity. First of all, he should be uh, served a notice as to why the state is trying to deprive him of his right to life and liberty and then he should be given an opportunity to represent himself. So, these are all part of what? It is all part of the procedural due process that the procedure by which the right to life and liberty of an individual is to be deprived has to be reasonable, it has to be fair in nature. So, come to this particular question. In fact, if you see the options that is given here, you can directly eliminate the procedural uh, established by law because procedure established by law is against the concept of what is called as the due process of law. And then equality before law, not necessarily this is the right answer. You can eliminate these two things. So, the confusion could be between the principle of natural justice or the fair application of law. Whatever option that is given in the question, it is related to what is called as a procedural due process. It is not talking much about the substantive due process. Although the due process involves both these concepts, 
to me the right answer here it is a fair application of law because fair application of law means once the law is there whatever procedure that is laid down in the law has to be just reasonable and it has to be fair and it should also be applied properly without any discrimination and there is no scope for arbitrary action for the state with regard to how the procedure is imposed and there cannot be discrimination as to how the procedure is imposed between different persons. So the right answer here would be the fair application of law and this fair application of law in implicit by itself includes what is called as the principle of natural justice. Because what does the procedure established by law, sorry, what does the uh, procedural due process provides for? The procedural due process also provides for what? It provides for that a fair application of law. The fair application of law also includes within itself serving a notice to the concerned individual and also allowing an individual to represent himself. So, the fair application of law already covers what is called as the principle of natural justice. So, the most appropriate answer would be what? The most appropriate answer would be the most appropriate answer in this particular case would be the the most appropriate answer in this particular case would be that is fair application of law answer c is the right answer let us quickly move to the next question so look into the next question consider the following statements statement 1 in india the persons or managed by, sorry, in India the prisons are managed. So, the key word is the prisons. In India, the prisons are managed by the state governments with their own rules and regulations for, for the day to day administration of prisons. In fact, if you see in India, the prisons are under the state list. So, if you look into the schedule 7 of the constitution, the prisons are an item in the state list. So, there is a technical issue that is happening. So, the prisons are under what? It is under what is called as the state list. So, once an item is in the state list, it is the prerogative of the state to make laws on those subjects. And accordingly, if you see, there is also an act which is called as uh, in India, the prisons are governed by the Prisons Act 1894. Please understand, 1894 was the law that is passed by the Britishers. And at that point of time itself, they have made this particular law and where they said that the subject of prisons shall be with the provincial governments. And at that point of time, there is no clear uh, federal provisions because the federation came into existence only in 1935. And subsequently, the government of India Act 1935 and the constitution of India has provided prisons in the state list. But even otherwise also, the Prisons Act which was passed in 1894, which is a pre-constitutional law, which is still forced in our country, that has also provided the power to regulate the prisons in the, uh, to the provincial governments, which is now with the state governments. So, which one of the following is are correct in respect of the above statements? So, the most appropriate answer would be both statements 1 and 2 are correct and statement 2 is the correct explanation of state, statement 2 is the correct explanation for statement 1. So, we will move to the next question. So, come to the question number 33. Which one of the following statement best reflect the chief purpose of the constitution? And this is one question I think there can be little bit of uh, uh, ambiguity in my personal opinion. Because any country wanted to have a constitution, the important purpose of a constitution is to first to provide for the way that the government is to be established. It also gives information as to how the government is to be established, what shall be the powers of the government and all those things. So, the constitution can provide for different forms of uh, government. It can be a democratic government, it can be an authoritarian government, it can be a totalitarian government, it can be a dictatorship, it can be a monarchy, it can be a republic. So, all these informations are given in the constitution. So, it enables the creation of a political office and government in the first place. That is also true. So, without a constitution, you cannot uh, have a political institution in the first place. So, what is the first thing that should come to your mind? The constitution enables for the creation of the political office and the government. So, this is, yes, it is true. Of course, it is the purpose of the constitution. It determines the objectives for the making of the necessary laws. It may or it may not have, say for example, the constitution of India provides for DPSP which provides the guidelines as to what kind of laws is to be made, but not necessarily in all the constitution, but it can provide also. And then if you come to option D, it secures the social justice and social equality and social security. 
not necessarily every constitution provides for that. It may provide or it may not provide, not necessarily it has to provide. And however, if you come to option C in the light of the emerging trends in the world, that in the light of more many countries in, our, in the world have becoming democracies. And in the light of that observation, if you see the main idea of having a constitution is to limit the powers of the government. So, although in my opinion, both option B and option C can be right, but because the answer is asking the chief uh, functions of having a constitution, what is the chief purpose of having a constitution in our country? Despite the fact that both B and C can be nearly close answer, going by the uh, uh, way that the UPSC has been asking question, UPSC is focusing more upon the constitutionalism and the idea of constitution. So, assuming that the idea of having a democratic constitution, the idea of having a constitution in the modern era is basically to limit the powers of the state. So, most appropriate answer could be option C. Although in my opinion, option B can also be the right answer. We will have to wait for the UPSC key to understand as to what shall be the correct question, uh, correct answer in this uh, particular case. Okay, so let us move to the next question. Come to the next question. In India, which one of the following constitutional amendment was widely believed to have enacted to overcome judicial interpretation of the fundamental rights? Not exactly 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act, you can easily eliminate the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act. Why not 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act? You will understand it is not the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act because of the fact that the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act is also called as a mini constitution which was done in the year 1976. It has made a lot of changes, not exactly to nullify a particular judgment which is passed by the Supreme Court. It was done in 1976. And against the amendment that has happened in 1976, then when the Janata Party came to power, because in 1976, it was the Congress Party. And it was, the amendment was carried out during the emergency time. And then to undo number of things, then the 44th Constitutional Amendment Act was passed in 1978. So, in both the cases, you can eliminate this. 86th Constitutional Amendment Act has in fact made, a, a, it has added a new fundamental right, that is right to education. And it is not against any judgment per se. So, that is also not the correct answer in this particular case. So, even by elimination, you can rule out this. So, it has added Article 21A into the Constitution, which provides for right to education. So, the most appropriate answer in this particular case is option A, that is the first constitutional amendment act. The first constitutional amendment act happened in the year 1951. The first constitutional amendment act happened in the year 1951. 1951, the first constitutional amendment act has happened and what is the idea behind this first constitutional amendment act? In fact, after uh, the commencement of the constitution, various state governments in India, in order to ensure the social and economic justice, they have brought in a number of reforms, especially the Land Reforms Act has been passed. And many of these Land Reforms Act was uh, struck down by the Supreme Court on the ground that it is violative of right to property, violative of right to property, especially on the grounds of Article 19 clause 1 sub clause f and article 31. So, in order to nullify these judgments, especially there was a case which is called as Kameshwar Prasad versus state of Bihar case. In order to nullify this particular judgment, subsequently the first constitutional amendment act was passed. It was passed under the leadership of Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru and they inserted two articles into the constitution that is article 31a and article 31b. So, in fact, both Article 31A and Article 31B was inserted by the first Constitutional Amendment Act without getting into as to what Article 31A and Article 31B, but in general, they have provided certain exceptions to certain laws under these categories that they shall not be struck down on the grounds of violation of the fundamental rights, especially the right to property. Okay. So, the right answer for this particular question is option A. Come to the next question. Consider the following organization. So, this is a quite simple question. Consider the following organizations or bodies. So, there is a topic in your syllabus, constitutional bodies, statutory bodies and all those things. So, in this case, consider the following organization or bodies in India. Statement 1, 
the national commission for backward classes the national commission for backward classes is it a constitutional body it was recently given a constitutional status in the year 2018 by article 338b which was inserted by the 102nd constitutional amendment act in the year 2018 so before that it was a statutory body but today the national commission for backward classes is a constitutional body national commission national uh, human rights commission the national human rights commission is not a constitutional body rather it is a statutory body it's a statutory body established under the human rights act human rights act 1993 so this is definitely not the answer you can eliminate this the national law commission in fact the national law commission is a body which is established by executive action it is established by an executive action or an executive resolution so it is in fact established by an executive resolution by ministry of law and justice so this is not the right answer so this is not a constitutional body the national consumer dispute redressal commission the national consumer redressal commission can be established under the consumer protection act Consumer Protection Act 1986. So, when you say it can be established under the Consumer Protection Act, that anything that can be established by an act of parliament is a statutory body. So, look into this particular thing while the National Commission for Backward Classes is a constitutional body, National Commission for Human Rights is a statutory body, National Law Commission is a executive body which is established by executive resolution or it is an extra constitutional body and National Consumer Dispute Redressal Commission is a statutory body. So, what is the right answer in this particular case? The only constitutional body is option A, that is one only. Let us move to the next question, that is question number 36. Again, a good question, consider the following statements. If the election of the President of India is declared void by the Supreme Court of India, all acts done by him or her in the performance of duties of his or her office of the president before the date of election shall become invalid. So, the question is saying that statement is saying that if suppose the election of president is invalidated by the Supreme Court because we know that the election of the president can be challenged in the Supreme Court. If the election of the president is invalidated, what will happen to the prior actions that has been done by the president of India? So, before his election is invalidated, the president has done few actions. So, what is going to happen to those actions? Probably the president has given assent to certain bills. Probably the president has made appointments to certain judges in the Supreme Court. Will those actions be invalidated? Those actions will not be invalidated. So, Article 71 of the Constitution makes it very clear that the prior actions that is done by the president will not be invalidated. For the reason, you will have to understand, the president in our country is not a real executive. In fact, the president acts in accordance with the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. So, what about this particular statement? This particular statement is wrong. Statement 2, the election for the post of the president of India can be postponed on the ground that some legislative assemblies have been dissolved and the elections are yet to take place. This is not possible under the constitution of India because the constitution says that the elections have to take place. Please understand the elections have to take place even before the, the term of the incumbent president is getting over. It does not matter whether any of the electoral college is vacant or not, but still the elections have to happen. Okay? So, in this particular case, this particular statement is also wrong. Statement 3, when a bill is presented to the president of India, the constitution prescribes the time limit within which he or she has to declare his or her assent. In fact, there is no time limit under the constitution to give the assent because there is no time limit which means that that is the reason we say that the president exercise what is called as pocket veto. In fact, there is no time limit for the president to give the assent and it is implied by this fact that the president exercise and he exercises pocket veto. In fact, all the three statements are wrong. Which of the statements given above is are correct? So, the right answer is option D that is none. Come to the next question. Question number 37. With reference to the finance bill and the money bill in the Indian parliament, consider the following statements. In fact, uh, students should know that uh, there are three types of financial bills. If you talk of the financial bills, in fact, money bill is also a financial bill, but it is a separate type of financial bill. And then you have financial bill 
type 1 and then you have financial bill type 2. So, these are the different types of all these things are financial bills. All these are financial bills, but however, uh, the money bill is a specific financial bill which is mentioned under article 110 of the constitution. If you see article 110 of the constitution, the money bill is a specific category of financial bill. It contains only those items which is mentioned in article 110, but apart from that article 117 of the constitution provides for other two types of financial bills. But anyways, the procedure for the money bill is little different from the other financial bills. Well, the procedure for money bill is laid down under article 109 of the constitution. The procedure for the financial bills subject to few exceptions, otherwise it is similar to that of what? Otherwise it is similar to that of an, it is similar to that of an ordinary bill. So, with this just come to this particular question, statement 1, when the Lok Sabha transmits the financial bill to the Rajya Sabha, it can amend or it can reject the bill. As per the constitution under article 109 of the constitution, when the Lok Sabha transmits a finance bill to the Rajya Sabha, it can amend or it can reject the bill. Yes, of course it can do because the finance bill is similar to that of an ordinary bill except for certain differences. So, once it is passed from the Lok Sabha to that of the Rajya Sabha, the Rajya Sabha has similar power as that of the ordinary bill. So, this particular statement is true. Statement 2, when the Lok Sabha transmits the money bill to the Rajya Sabha, it cannot amend or reject the bill, it can only make recommendations that is also true. So, if you see in case of money bill, in case of money bill there is no possibility that the Rajya Sabha can reject it. The Rajya Sabha can only make recommendations but that is also not binding on the Lok Sabha. So, this particular statement is also true by virtue of article 109. Statement number 3, in the case of disagreement between the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha, there is no joint sitting for money bill, but a joint sitting becomes necessary for a finance bill. Now, please understand in case of a money bill, the maximum power that the president has got, sorry, the Rajya Sabha has got is only that they can delay the passage of a bill by 14 days, nothing more than that. But whereas in case of a finance bill, it is similar to that of an ordinary bill. So, in case of disagreement, then there is a possibility for a joint setting, but that is not the case in case of a money bill. So, in case of money bill, the maximum power that the Rajya Sabha has got is it can delay it by 14 days. So, while joint setting is possible in case of the finance bill, that is not possible in case of the money bill, okay. So, which of the statements given above is or correct? I am just going to the statement number 3. In case of disagreement between the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha, there is no joint setting, that is true, but joint setting becomes necessary for a finance bill. So, joint setting becomes necessary for a finance bill, so it is also little uh, ambiguous because when you say that is it mandatory to go for a joint sitting, it is not mandatory under the constitution to go for a joint sitting, but if the bill has to be passed, then a joint sitting has to be convened under article 108 of the constitution. Assuming that, let us uh, see that this particular statement is true. So, which of the statements given above is are correct? So, that should be option C, okay. So, option C is the right answer. Come to the next question. With reference to the scheduled areas in India, consider the following statements. So, the scheduled area under the constitution is provided by virtue of article 244 class 1. Article 244 class 1 provides for the scheduled area and the elaborate explanation with regard to the scheduled area is given under the schedule 5 of the constitution. It is given under schedule 5 of the constitution and if you look into schedule 5 of the constitution, the president has a power to declare an area to be a scheduled area, even in the states also, it is only the power of the president. So, come to statement number 1, within a state, the notification of an area as a scheduled area takes place through an order of the president. Yes. So, wherever there is a predominant tribal population, except in the state of Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura and Mizoram, in all those states, scheduled area can be demarcated and who has the power to do that? The president has a power to do that. Come to statement number 2 and in the way that the scheduled areas are demarcated, the largest administrative unit is forming with regard to a scheduled area is the district and the lowest in uh, lowest is the cluster of village in the block. So, this particular statement is also true the way how the scheduled area is now drawn in our country today. And then come to the last statement, it says the chief minister of the concerned state are required to submit annual report to the union home ministry on the administration of scheduled areas in the state. So, that is not true. It is not that the chief minister who has to submit the report under the constitution, it is a governor who has to submit the report to the home ministry. 
So this particular statement is wrong. So the right answer would be, so both statements 1 and 2 are correct. How many above statements are correct? It is only 2. So option B is the right answer. Okay. Come to the next question. Consider the following statements. Statement 1, the Supreme Court of India has has held in some judgments that the reservation policies made under Article 16, Class 4 of the Constitution of India would be limited by Article 335 for the maintenance of efficiency of administration. In fact, please understand this Article 16, Class 4 provides for positive discrimination. So, it can provide for uh, reservation of uh, seats in the public employments to certain categories of people because the Constitution also provides for the equal protection of laws. So, they can do positive discrimination. And using this particular article, the parliament has made provisions. In fact, the government came out with an idea of reserving seats, not only in case of initial appointment, but also reservation in promotions. They came out with an idea of reservation in promotions. And this reservation in promotion was struck down by the Supreme Court in the Indra Sani case. Indra Sani case and in 1992 and subsequent to this, particular judgment, the Supreme Court has, the Parliament has enacted an amendment to this constitution that is Article 16, Class 4A, which provided for the reservation to the uh, reservation in promotions. So that is true that the constitution provides for reservation in promotions and in certain cases, the Supreme Court has upheld. Now, the Supreme Court has upheld this reservation in promotions by principle. Article 16, Class 4A has been upheld, which came out of 16, Class 4. But however, the thing that you have to understand is when the constitution was amended and when this article 16 class 4a was brought in, it was challenged in a case which is called as the Naharaj case, wherein the Supreme Court has made it very clear that on the one hand, they accepted the principle of reservation in promotion. They said while giving reservation in promotion, it is must that what has to be taken into account by the government is that the government should make sure that the administrative efficiency is not compromised. So, for administrative efficiency, we have to refer to Article 335 of the Constitution. So, what is Article 335 of the Constitution is saying? Article 335 of the Constitution is saying that on the one hand, that the needs of the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe and their representation in the government has to be taken care. But at the same time, while taking their interest with regard to their representation in the administrative services, the administrative efficiency should not be compromised. That is what is the crux of Article 335. But however, the problem is under Article 335, what amounts to efficiency of administration is not defined. So, with this information, come to this particular statement. Article 335 of the Constitution of India defines the term efficiency. So, it does not define the term efficiency, although it says that while taking care of the interests of the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe in the government services, the administrative efficiency should not be compromised. So, this particular statement is wrong. The Supreme Court of India, so come to the first statement, the Supreme Court of India has held in some of the judgments that the reservation policies made under Article 16, Class 4 of the Constitution of India would be limited by Article 335 and the maintenance of efficiency of administration. This is true because Article 16, Class 4 initially provided for the reservation in administration, the reservation in promotions and subsequently it came out through Article 16, Class 4A. So, with this come to the options, both the statement 1 and 2 are correct. So, both are not correct. Both statement 1 and statement 2 are correct. No, it is also not true. While Statement C, statement 1 is correct and the statement 2 is incorrect, okay. So, the most appropriate answer is option C. So, option C is the right answer here. Let us move to the next question. Question number 77, statement 1. According to the constitution of India, the central government has a duty to protect the states from the internal disturbance. So, this is very much true. Article 355 of the constitution entrusts this responsibility upon the central government. Now, take the example of uh, recent disturbance in Manipur. When there was disturbance in Manipur, then the central government has sent some of its forces to protect and to maintain peace in the state of Manipur. So, it is a responsibility of the central government under Article 355. Statement 2, the constitution of India exempts the states from providing legal counsel to a person being held for preventive detention. If you look into Article 22 of the constitution, Article 22 of the constitution provides certain rights to the individuals. So, what are the rights that is guaranteed to the individuals under Article 22? 
an individual who is detained or arrested should be informed of its grounds of arrest and he has to be produced before the nearest magistrate within a period of 24 hours and also that he should be allowed a counsel of his choice to defend himself. Now, while all these rights are available to not only to the citizens but also to the aliens, but it is not available to an enemy alien and also it is not available to a person under preventive detention. So, this is very important. It is not available to an individual under preventive detention. So, I hope the students understand the difference as to what is a punitive detention and a preventive detention. While in case of punitive detention, all these rights are available, but these rights are not available in case of what? In case of preventive detention. So, with this understanding, so statement 2 is also right. Come to statement number 3. According to the Prevention of Terrorism Act 2002, confession to the accused before the police officer cannot be used as an evidence. In fact, confession made to a police officer cannot be used as an evidence against him. Then it becomes a police state. We are not a police state. We are a democratic state. So, in principle, that is not accept acceptable. And in case of the act also, if you look into section 25 and 26 of the act, if you read them together, it also makes it very clear that admission made in front of a police officer cannot be used as an evidence against them. So, this particular statement is also true. So, which of the statements given above is are correct? So, the right statement would be all the three. So, all the three are the right answer. Come to the next question, question number 80. Consider the following statements in respect of election of the President of India. So, if you look into the, uh, the election of the President of India, so one, the members of the members nominated either to the either houses of the parliament or the legislative assemblies of the state are eligible to be included in the electoral college. So, if you look into here, the nominated members are not part of the electoral college, only the elected members are part of the electoral college. So, this is definitely not part of the uh, provisions in the constitution. So, you can safely eliminate this. Higher the number of uh, elective members, elective assembly seats, higher is the value of vote of each MLA in that state. So, this is not necessarily true because you will have to understand the formula for this. How do you calculate the value of vote of an MLA? The value of vote of an MLA is equal to the total population of that particular state divided by total number of elected MLAs, total number of elected MLA into 1000. So, that means more is the number of elected members automatically the value of the vote of the MLA is going to reduce. So, by this uh, logic you can also eliminate this particular statement. The value of vote of each MLA of Madhya Pradesh is greater than Kerala. So, this is a very factual thing and if you can know the population and we know that the 1971 census is used as the population and if you know the MLAs in both state of Madhya Pradesh and Kerala, the value of MLA in Kerala is higher than the value of MLA in in Madhya Pradesh. So, this particular statement is also wrong. Statement 3, the value of vote of each MLA of Puducherry is higher than that of Arunachal Pradesh because the ratio of total population to the total number of elective seats in Puducherry is greater as compared to Arunachal Pradesh. So, this is very factual. So, if you take this particular ratio that the total population of Puducherry by the elected MLAs in Puducherry the ratio is much higher. So, automatically the value of vote of an MLA from Puducherry is higher. So, how many statements, how many of the above statements are correct? So, we have only one statement, only one is correct of the above. So, the answer would be option A. So, option A is the right answer. Come to, okay, so you can just have a look into this uh, particular slide. So, you can, here you can see the value of the MLAs. So, the value of MLA in case of Kerala is much higher than that of what is called as in Madhya Pradesh. So, in Madhya Pradesh, there are 230 MLAs, in Kerala 140 MLAs, but if you see the value, the value of MLAs in case of Madhya Pradesh is just 131, but the value of Kerala is much higher. So, it does not directly depend upon the MLAs per se, but it depends upon what? It depends upon the population of that particular state, okay. So, that is the idea that you should have when you solve these questions. And here is how you will determine the population, the value of the vote of the MLA, which we have just seen. So, we will just move to the next question. Come to next question, question number 84. Consider the following statements in respect of the national flag of India according to the national, in according to the flag code of India 2002. Now, India has its own flag, which was adopted by the Constituent Assembly. And in 2002, the government also came out with a flag code as to how this flag has to be used for all practical purpose. And if you look into the flag code of India, it is very important. 
that the following size has been given as the standard size. So, different size can be used for different purpose. So, there are 9 standard dimensions that is given as per the flag code 2002. And with this uh, dimensions, just come to statement number 1. One of the standard size of the national flag of India is 600 mm into 400 mm. So, there is no such standard size. Although there are different standard size. So, this particular statement would be wrong. Come to statement number 2. The ratio of length to the height that is width of the flag shall be 3 is to 2. And this is factually right. So, this is what is given in the flag code. So, statement 2 is right. And with this, if you come to the statement, which one of the following is correct in respect of the above statements? Statement A, both statement 1 and statement 2 are correct and statement 2 is the correct explanation. So, this you can eliminate. Both statement 1 and statement 2 are correct and statement 2 is not the correct explanation. So, this is also not correct. Statement 1 is correct, but not and statement 2 is incorrect. So, this is also wrong. Statement 1 is incorrect, but statement 2 is correct. So, option D is the right answer. So, now we will move to the next question. We are almost nearing the end of the uh, discussion for polity. There are around 14 to 15 questions, unconventional questions a little this year. Come to the next question. Consider the following statements in respect of the constitution day. 29th, sorry, 26th November is considered to be the constitution day because that is the day on which the constituent assembly has adopted the constitution of India. And since then, the day has been chosen as the Constitution Day and it is also the intention behind celebrating this Constitution Day is to promote the awareness among the people, okay. So, consider the following statements in respect of the Constitution Day. Statement 1, the Constitution Day is celebrated on 26 November every year to promote the constitutional values among the citizens. So, this particular statement is right. So, we will move to the next statement. If you see the next statement, so first statement is right. Statement 2, on 26 November 1949, the Constituent Assembly of India set up a drafting committee under the chairmanship of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar to prepare the draft constitution. While the statement is partially true, the drafting committee was set up in the Constituent Assembly and it was set up under the leadership of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. That is all true. But the constant assembly was not set up on 26th of November 1949. This was the day the constituent assembly has already adopted the constitution. So, when was the constituent, uh, when was the constituent assembly was set up to, sorry, when was the drafting committee in the constituent assembly was set up? To be very specific, it was on 29th August, 29th August 1947, okay. So, while statement 1 is correct, statement 2 is wrong. So, what would be the right answer? Statement 1 is correct, but statement 2 is incorrect. So, that would be option C. Come to the next question. With reference to home gods, consider the following statements. Now, first of all, you have to understand as to what this home gods. The home gods are like the civilian force and the civilian force will help the state police in maintaining the law and order in that particular state. So, this was how initially it was started. But subsequent to the uh, Chinese war in 1962, the home guards also started playing a role in protecting the internal disturbance and also any other uh, external excursion from the other countries. So, majorly the internal disturbance and the internal security of our country. And today the home guards in our country, if you see the home guards in our country are mainly regulated by the various legislations which is passed by the various state governments. Although the Ministry of Home Affairs can give certain policy guidelines, but majorly it is regulated by the regulations of the uh, act which is passed by the various state governments. So, with this, this particular statement is wrong. Statement 2 is right. And in addition to the maintenance of law and order and the internal security matters, the Home Guard is also now posted along the borders along with the various border forces, especially in the states which is having, which is sharing border with other countries and also in coastal states like Gujarat, Rajasthan and some of the northeastern states. So, this is where they are effectively placed. So, this particular statement is also true. So, how many of the above statements are correct? So, if you see of this statement 1 is incorrect and then statement 2 and statement 3 is correct. So, the right answer is option B. Come to the last question in polity. So, the last question in polity with reference to India, consider the following. So, again it is a very unmentioned question, very factual question. So, that means it is also a clear indication that in the future students should also be prepared for something like this which is unexpected to come in the polity paper. So, look into this particular question statement here it says the action 
unauthorized wearing of police or a military uniform, somebody who is disguising and uh, who is uh, cheating others by wearing a police or a military uniform who actually is not a police or a part of military just to get access to certain places. So, that is definitely a punishable offence under the Official Secrets Act. So, Official Secrets Act talk about this specific provision. So, statement 1 is right. Come to statement number 2, knowingly misleading or otherwise interfering with the police officer or a military officer when engaged in their duties. There is no such provision when it comes to the Indian Evidence Act. So, you can just apply your common sense also here. Now, Indian Evidence Act is majorly produced as an evidence in a court of law and when it comes to most of the criminal cases and civil cases, but such a provision may not be there as a part of the Indian Evidence Act. Even if you do not know exactly what is a provision, just by applying your common uh, sense and a little bit of logic, still you can get this particular statement wrong. While such a provision is there in the Army Act, in the Police Act and also certain provisions in the Indian Penal Code, but it is definitely not part of the Indian Evidence Act. So, this particular statement is wrong. Come to statement number 3, celebrating gunfire which can endanger the personal safety of others. So, in order to regulate the misuse of the gunfire and all those things during celebrations or by celebrities. So, the Arms Act 2019 provides for such a provision. In fact, the specific provision deals with this and it makes it a punishable offence. So, this particular statement is true. So, statement 1 and statement 3 are right. And if you see the answer for this particular question, well, statement 2 is wrong, statement 3 is right. So, which of the above pairs or how many, how many of the above pairs are correctly matched? So, while statement 2 is wrong, so the remaining 1 and 3 are right. So, the right answer would be option B. So, we are almost done with the polity discussion. So, try to uh, uh, go through the discussion so that you get a fair idea as to what may be the right and wrong answer. So, next in line is uh, Abhishek sir is here who will take up the discussion for the history part and also the science and technology part. Okay. Hope you will uh, enjoy the discussion with Abhishek sir also. Let me just pass on the mic to Abhishek sir. We will continue with the discussion. Thank you very much. All the very best to all the aspirants who have written their examination and waiting for the result. So, uh, we are very hopeful that you will clear your examination and I wish all the best once again. Thank you very much. So, hello everybody, uh, welcome to the session and uh, I think uh, sir has already completed this polity portion. So, from here on uh, I will be carrying forward the session with the discussion of the questions which have been asked from the part of Indian history and science and technology. All right. So, uh, just a second. All right. Just let me fit this mic and everything. Right. All right. So, uh, now let us move to the questions related to, okay, the section of Indian art and culture and history. Right. Okay, everyone. So, first of all, the first question is there. I think all of you can see this question, right? Question number 41. In which one of the following regions was, right, Dhanya Kataka, which flourished as a prominent Buddhist center under the Mahasanghika located? So, guys, in each, uh, I think uh, last few years, you might have seen the trend of question that uh, they are asking the locations of uh, Indian historical significant, uh, right. And uh, that is basically the same trend which is followed here. The question is related to the Dhanya Kataka, right. Dhanya Kataka basically uh, it is located in Andhra, right. You might have heard about the place called Amravati, okay. So, Amravati is, right, that was also a very famous site for, right, famous site for the Buddhist, okay, Buddhist sect of Mahasanghikas, okay, Mahasanghikas. So, basically that was the place where, where uh, Dhanya Kataka, right, Dhanya Kataka that was located near uh, Amravati and uh, they have asked this question. In fact, uh, if you go through the questions related to the, uh, you know, Buddhist places, the right, they have asked the questions from the various such places in last five years or so. 
at least two or three times they have asked the questions okay so right answer to this question that would be andhra right now if we just uh, right move further right move further and we can see here this is the amravati stoop okay and this appears to be a very unique stupa why so because the most important part is that it is right using it is using a white marble right white marble structure even though right even though this was a later construction right later construction that means the original stupa might not be constructed like that however it was constructed later on right it was constructed later on as with the help of white marble right now now moving to the next question question number 42 that was a, a very right you can say significant question again from the part of art and culture from the part of art and culture the question was there that with reference to the ancient india right with reference to the ancient india the consider the following statements the concept of stupa is buddhist in origin now with this first statement with the first statement let me tell you very clearly in fact yesterday also i had taken a session and uh, in the yesterday's session itself right now i had just discussed with the students that whenever this question is there that whenever this statement is there that uh, no stupas are buddhist in origin this should be considered as an incorrect statement why so because let me tell you the history behind it because you know what are the stupas basically stupas are generally a repository of the relics that is the correct statement but this repository of the relics right relics that basically that could be covered under the mound of soil as well right the mound of soil as well then or the mound of or the mound of bricks as well okay just a second man or the mound of brick as well right so basically bricks okay or soil anything could be used and that has a mention even in the pre-buddhist right even in the pre-buddhist right traditions right pre-buddhist traditions also it has got mention got it everyone now if we come to the third statement that stupa was votive and commemorative structure in buddhist tradition that statement sounds that statement sounds more logical and more correct statement and why so because stupa used to be votive what is the meaning of votive stupa what is the votive stupa the stupa which houses the right which houses the relics of lord buddha right lord buddha or his disciples okay or his disciples so basically any stupa which actually contains or which actually has the you know or uh, ashes or the relics that is called as the votive stupa then what is the commemorative stupa guys commemorative stupa is basically right it is basically to commemorate an event an event okay a significant event for example for example if we talk about uh, the event of dhamma chakra pravartan remember the name dhamma chakra pravartan when did it happen it took place at uh, uh, sarnath okay and uh, what was that event basically when buddha buddha preached the first sermon to his five disciples okay and that event was basically commemorated with the help of a stupa constructed known as the right known as dhamek stupa right, known as dhamek stupa right just a second guys i think there is some uh, technical trouble here and uh, all right that is basically called as the dhamek stupa okay so commemorative stupa had example that is dhamek all right dhamek and that is basically making the second statement and third statement as the correct statements as the correct statement the first one is right, the first one is not so correct one and that is why the right answer to this question that should be option number b that only two statements are correct only two statements are correct got it everyone now moving to the next question 
right next question what is the next question that is with reference to ancient south india korkai right pom puhar and muchiri were well known as right the question is asking that korkai pom puhar and muchiri were well known now this is the key term here well known now students make one thing very very clear that so, right at certain times there are the questions asked from upsc or asked by upsc that create a lot of ambiguity lot of confusion this is another similar type of question why is there any uh, why is there a confusion because the first thing that is they were the capital cities but they were more famous to to be recalled as the port cities they were capital cities also and they were port cities as well but they were well known they were well known as the port city so as of now my emphasis that would be on the port cities because everybody understands that korkai korkai was the korkai was the ancient capital of right korkai was the ancient capital of pandyas okay ancient capital of pandyas all right and famous for the famous port for the pearl trade as well right port that was famous for pearl trade okay pearl trade talking about uh, pum puhar okay pum puhar was basically the ancient capital of ancient capital of cholas and a very famous port side as well okay port as well then muchiri muchiri was the capital of cheras okay capital of cheras and a very famous port as well famous port as well now the question comes right question is asking that which was that these sites were well known so capital was not so well known because they were capital for once right a few years and they they were replaced by the other cities however if we talk about that by right for what for how much time were they a port city so they were a port city for you know centuries and that's why they were well known as the port cities my answer to this question should be option number b port cities however it depends upon upsc that to which option uh, do they stick right with so here now right right now here i am taking this option b as the answer now next question that is as a figure you can see the locations right muchiri is there then uh, korkai is there all right and then uh, pom puhar right pom puhar is basically not uh, visible here very clearly right anyway but you can simply right right you can simply put this place here right pom puhar was basically nothing but the kaveri patnam right that was the that was the place where the puhar city was located okay so all three were all three were the places right places where the ports as well as capitals were there now next question uh, that is which one of the following explains the practice of the vatta kirutal right vatta kirutal guys sangam literature and the terminology related to the sangam literature or the sangam era right that is always crucial always very very important for the upsc examination okay so in fact in the live classes as well i have clearly mentioned a number of times that the students must not evade from the sangam literature part but what happens that due to the difficult terms right due to the you know complex pronunciation the students usually try to skip this part but let me warn you for this because every year they keep asking the questions from the sangam part and that's very very crucial to keep in mind even this year also vattakirutal as mentioned in sangam poems okay so the first option is that kings employing women bodyguards second is saying that learned persons assembling in royal courts to discuss the religious and philosophical matters third is saying the young girls keeping watch over agricultural fields and driving away birds and animals then 
a king defeated in a battle committing ritual suicide by starving himself to death okay so now let me uh, tell you one very see very simple thing that if you uh, might have studied the textbook of uh, tamil nadu board right indian history of the ancient part or if you might have studied uh, the notes or the book of the upinder singh okay that uh, part which contains the text on sangam literature or sangam age this statement is directly mentioned in that book itself however it is very difficult uh, to remember you know such terms just by uh, studying it once or twice so i would rather tell that this question was a little bit uh, you know difficult for the people who were not so well versed with the sangam uh, chapter however if you have studied that even once you will get the answer that is a king defeated in the battle right he committed the suicide he committed suicide right as a part of ritual of starving himself as a part of ritual of starving himself to the death and that is the right answer to this question okay what is the right answer this is the right answer d is the right answer now okay so moving to the next question what is the next question saying here consider the following dynasties okay consider the following dynasties okay everyone hoysalas gadhwalas kakatiyas and yadavas hoysalas gadhwalas kakatiyas and yadavas now before discussing the solution of this question let me tell you one thing if you have observed the pattern of questions in indian history you might have understood one thing that since 2019 since 2019 2020 2021 22 in these four years at least for three years they have asked the questions based on the medieval kingdoms or the medieval dynasties and their chronological and their chronological arrangement okay so there also right here also they have asked the question that how many of the above dynasties established their kingdoms in early 8th century ad now this could be a tricky question this could be a tricky question and why so because as far as the hoysalas kakatiyas and yadavas are concerned they have no clear establishments no clear establishments and in the, in the 8th century in the 8th century right but even if we talk about the gadhwalas if we talk about the gadhwalas right who were the gadhwalas the rajput kingdom right which ruled in the area of modern uttar pradesh mostly in the region of the you know gangetic plains however as per their chronicles their kingdom was established during the you know 9th 10th 9th century itself even though when we talk about the right historical documentation when we talk about the influential establishment of the kingdom right we can clearly say that none of these none of these kingdoms were in existence none of these kingdoms were in existence during the 8th century right however it remains to be seen it remains to be seen that uh, which particular right which particular uh, part of which particular uh, you know source does upsc believe on because let me tell you one thing that uh, there are at least a few sources which claim that gadhwalas right their dynasty was in existence during the 8th century but yes if we talk about the kingdom of that dynasty it was not there it was not there so whatever may be the case the right answer should be option number d none of these right none of these next question with reference to ancient indian history consider the following pairs all right with reference to the ancient indian history consider the following pairs devi chandragupta right devi chandraguptam hammir mahakavya okay milind panha right milind panha and nay neeti vakyamrit neeti vakyamrit 
all right then there are the authors bilhan then right nayachandra suri then nagarjuna then somadev suri okay now guys how many pairs right how many pairs are correctly matched this is the question so let me just tell you one thing that uh, if we talk about that how many pairs are correctly matched i think mudra rakshas and devi chandraguptam these two are the two most famous sanskrit playwrights written by whom written by written by vishakh dutt okay written by vishakh dutt all right everyone not by bilhan but by vishakh dutt talking about hamir mahakavya written by nayachand sruri right nayachand right basically this is absolutely correct one this is written by nayachand sruri there is no doubt about it now talking about the third one milind panho milind panho is basically right this so this question was even asked in the up pcsar this question was asked in up pcs this is a very common thing very common question milind panho written by nag sen nag sen right not by nagarjuna nagarjuna he was actually a chemist and a philosopher but nag sen he was a buddhist teacher and a monk right from whom there was a discussion right with whom there was a discussion of the kushan ruler kanishk right now i'm sorry of the indo greek ruler minander and that basically that basically is compiled in the form of in the form of a conversation pattern of the book and that's called as the milind panho the questions of minander the questions of minander all right that is the meaning of milind panho written by nagasen then neeti vakyamrit is written by somadev suri written by somadev suri there is no doubt in this particular thing so right answer will be right answer will be that there are only only two pairs which are correctly matched okay there are only two pairs which are correctly matched okay next question the question is uh, related to a statement related to a statement okay so basically what is the question souls are not only the property of animal and plant life but also of the rocks running water and many other right and many other natural objects not looked on as living by other religious sects okay so the above statement reflects right which right one of the core belief of which of the following religious sects of the ancient india the core of belief that is right answer would be right answer will be option number b jainism okay jainism basically has the core of belief where they where they believe on which thing they believe on the atma vad that they create they, they create a impression that there is a essence of atma essence of atma in or the soul in each and every each and every element in this entire universe okay so if you might be aware that they just uh, you know divide the entire universe in the part of in the part of jeev right just a second here there is uh, definitely some sort of trouble going on related to this uh, okay so they okay jeev all right just a second and pudgal okay jeev and pudgal pudgal is basically that ajeev pudgal is basically that ajeev all right and ajeev means what non living non living and jeev is basically living but according to jainism both of them contain both of them contain soul okay not just that they have also got they have also got right sat or basically the dharma or asat that is adharma 
and they have also got time that is kal then they have got space that is akash okay so they have got different aspects of the universe and they believe that the entire universe is basically a continuum continuum that means it does not destroy it just keeps continuously growing and going on with the help of these six different elements these six distinct elements right that is according to the jain philosophy and that is where we come to the conclusion or we come to the point that they believe that there is a there is an essence of soul in each and every ele element of the entire universe now moving to the next question all right uh, who among the following rulers of uh, vijayanagara empire constructed a large dam across tungabhadra river and a canal come aqueduct several kilometers long from the river to the capital city okay from river to the capital city now if we right if we just uh, take a few lines a few lines written in the ncert the new ncert book of class 12th okay and in the chapter where they talk about the vijayanagar right the vijayanagar basically in that chapter itself we find the mention of this particular statement indirectly but even if we have uh, done this chapter from the basic point of view that we have studied about devarai we have studied about krishna devarai right devarai second uh, different dynasties sangam dynasty okay sulu dynasty tulu dynasty ravidu dynasty all the four dynasties then we come to the information that devarai first of the sangam dynasty okay who actually ruled from 1406 to 1422 right he actually constructed or he started the construction of construction of a huge dam on tungabhadra river on tungabhadra river and also he took out a canal out of it up to the vijayanagar up to the capital city of vijayanagar for the purpose of drinking and irrigation for the purpose of drinking and irrigation all right so that would be the answer to this question that would be the answer to this question that is devarai right devarai was the one who did this act right devarai was the one who did this act now moving to the next question now what is the next question saying next question is saying that who among the following rulers of uh, medieval gujarat surrendered deev to portuguese surrendered deev to portuguese okay so the right answer to this question that should be option number c bahadur shah option number c bahadur shah all right everyone so bahadur shah was the one who actually surrendered deev to who surrendered deev to portuguese however however let me do a you know let me make a clarification on this point actually the question is asking that who surrendered who surrendered this got it so there could be two opinions let us uh, you know let us uh, just wait that what answer does upsc choose because that will be the final answer however let me give you both the aspects of this question actually in the year 1510 and in the year 1537 right now twice we get the mention of uh, you know the clashes between the portuguese and the rulers of gujarat in the first case it was mahmud begadha okay mahmud begadha who had clearly who had clearly surrendered dew area to the portuguese however in case of the second one in 1537 bahadur shah bahadur shah was the one who was defeated by the portuguese and the dew island that dew region was actually captured 
permanently by Portuguese from Bahadur Shah. Okay, so if you go to the official website, right, official website of the Ministry of Culture or official website of the Dew administration, you find the mention of this one, 1537, that Bahadur Shah was the last Sultan in Gujarat where uh, whose uh, you know, authority was located there in the Dew region. However, if we go through the history books also, we find that there was a battle in 1510 as well where Mahmud Begada had surrendered the Dew temporarily to the Portuguese. But the right answer for now we are considering Bahadur Shah because the you know, government website etc. they contain the name of Bahadur Shah. But let us see that which answer does UPSC choose, right? So right now we have taken the answer as option number C. Got it everyone? So moving to the next question. By which of the following acts was the Governor General of Bengal designated as, right, designated as the Governor General of India? All right, designated as the Governor General of India. So, the first one that is the Regulating Act. Second one is the Pitts India Act. Third one is the Charter Act of 1793. And fourth one is the Charter Act of 1833. This is, I think, the most easy question, rather a cheesy question, right? It's very, it's question is like, you know, you know, a peanuts for everybody. It's so easily available. The answer is so easily available, right? Now, the right answer to this question, Governor General of Bengal was designated as the Governor General of India, right? 1833, the Charter Act of 1833, that is the right answer. And who was the first Governor General of India? Lord William Bentick. He was the first Governor General of India. Got it? Okay, everyone. Not just that, several other things also change with this particular uh, act, such as the British, they stopped using the currencies of the Mughal mints. Rather, they started minting their own coins as the designated currencies of the exchange. Also, they stopped paying any tributes to the Mughal King, right, emperor, which was called as Nazar, which was called as Nazar, right. They also stopped using the title Emperor of India, right. And why so? Why so? Because they were not regarding the, they were not regarding the Mughal emperor as the emperor of that part which they were having under their control, okay. So, you know, different things changed with this particular, with this particular Charter Act. Also, there were a lot of other changes as well, which we would be discussing further on. Now, moving to the next question. The next question is that, right, with reference to the Indian history, Alexander Ree, A. H. Longhurst, Robert Seville, then James Burgess and, James Burgess and Walter Elliot, they were associated with what? Guys, these all, these all are very famous archaeologists, famous archaeologists. In fact, if you might have gone through, right, if you might have gone through the, you know, a little bit of details, you might have understood very well that nobody is there that who does not know Walter Elliot or who does not know A.H. Longhurst or Alexander Ree, etc., right? They are actually famous archaeological, right, excavator archaeological experts, okay, archaeologists. Got it? So that is the right answer to this question. Now, moving to the next one, that is uh, consider the following pairs. This is the second last question of Indian history, after which I will be continuing with the science and tech portion. That is also very interesting this time. They have asked good questions. So let us see the question in Indian, Indian history as of now. The site is there, Besanagar, Bhaja and Sittanavasal, right, well known for Shaivite cave shrine, Buddhist cave, cave shrine, okay, Buddhist cave shrine, Jain cave shrine, okay, which is the right answer to this question, how many pairs, the question is saying how many of the above pairs are correctly matched. So if we see base nagar or Vidisha, base nagar or Vidisha, okay, Guys, Base Nagar or Vidisha, it has a cave site, it has a cave site called as, right, called as 
I think uh, this uh, panel has got some sort of issue. Okay. So it has got the cave site called as Udayagiri. Okay. Udayagiri. And Udayagiri is well known for the Varaha sculpture. Okay. Varaha sculpture. And guys, this Varaha sculpture is basically related to the Vaishnavite tradition. Okay. Vaishnavite tradition. So, this cannot be correct. This cannot be correct. Okay. Now, if we talk about, uh, if we talk about the second and third, so Bhaja actually contains, it, it has the, it has the Buddhist shrine, right? It has Buddhist shrine and Sitran Vasal, Jain cave. Sitran Vasal is a place in Tamil Nadu region. It has the Jain caves, right? It has the Jain caves. So, if we talk about Karle, Bhaja, Kanheri, you know, these are the rock cut caves present in the Maharashtra region, okay? That is Karle, Bhaja, Kanheri, okay? Pandavleni, all these places are, and apart from Ajanta Elora, everybody know about Ajanta Elora, but these are little bit less famous. So, all these are the famous rock cut sites in the Maharashtra region. Vagh, that is Vagh is present in Madhya Pradesh. Okay, Junnar is present, Junnar, basically that is present in the region of, you know, the border region, adjoining region of the Maharashtra and Gujarat region, right? So, basically all these, you know, all these are the caves, which are rock cut caves and found related to Buddhism, bound related to Buddhism, okay? There are other caves as well, such as uh, one is the... Uh, that is a group of caves nearby Gwalior region that is connected to the Jainism, okay? So, Jainism, Buddhism and Brahmanism, all these three religions, they had distinct structures, right? Distinct rock cut caves related to them, right? Now, however, this one is having Buddhist cave and this one is having Jain cave. So, that is the correct one. Right answer to this question is option number B, that only two, right? Two of them are correctly matched. Second and third are correctly matched. All right, now, next question is that consider the following statements. Statement 1, 7th August is declared as the National Handloom Day. Got it? Statement 2 is saying that it was in the 1905 that the Swadeshi movement was launched on the same day. So, which one of the following is correct in respect of the above statements? So, the question is saying that both statement 1 and statement 2 are correct and statement 2 is the correct explanation for the statement 1. Got it? And second one is saying that both statement 1 and statement 2 are correct and statement 2, right? Statement 2 is not the correct explanation for the statement 1. All right? Then third one is saying that statement 1 is correct but statement 2 is incorrect. Um, fourth one is saying statement 1 is incorrect but statement 2 is correct. Now, what should be the right answer to this question everybody? The right answer to this question? So, the right answer to this question that should be option number, right, option number first that uh, both statement 1, statement 1 and statement 2 are correct and statement 2 is the correct explanation for the statement 1. Why? Because everybody knows that on the 7th of August, Okay, 7th of August, 1905, there was the declaration of, declaration of Swadeshi and boycott. Swadeshi and boycott movement. And to commemorate that event, to commemorate that event, what do we do? We celebrate that day as the National Handloom Day. National Handloom Day. Right? And that is why, that is why both of them state, uh, are correct and that is the correct explanation as well for the first statement. Now, moving to the next question. In fact, this is the last question for Indian history. So, guys, now we will be doing the section of uh, science and technology. So, I hope that all of you must have gone uh, very well through the details and through the solutions of the Indian history as we saw that there are certain questions which are having some sort of doubtful answers or some ambiguity as well. But this is the nature of UPSC, we cannot help it. Each and every year they provide certain questions which have got the distinctive answers 
or you know, which keeps surprising us every year. Now, moving to the next section of the science and technology, let us continue with the science questions. And uh, here is the very first question. Consider the following statements, right? Carbon fibers are used in the manufacture of components used in automobiles and aircrafts. Okay, automobiles and aircrafts. Second statement saying that carbon fibers once used cannot be recycled, cannot be recycled. Now tell me one thing, tell me one thing that uh, carbon fibers, are they not being promoted as a very, you know, capable and very viable alternative to the conventional metals or the metalloids which are actually used, metal or the alloys which are actually being used right now, which are actually being used for the construction of the various equipments and machineries right now. So, if the statement says that carbon fibers once used cannot be recycled, do you really think that is it logical to promote the use of carbon fibers? Obviously not. So, this statement cannot be correct. It cannot be correct. Even if we do not know that, uh, you know, what are the uh, implications of uh, recycling of carbon fiber or not. If we are not aware about that, even then we can decide this. Then first one, carbon fibers are used in the manufacture of the components using, right, using, uh, that is used in automobiles and aircrafts, all right. So, definitely the statement is correct, right, definitely the statement is correct. Uh, this uh, board is, I think, creating a lot of trouble, but I hope that you won't mind it, those who are watching it, all right. Now, the right answer to this question that should be that should be option number option number a right that is only one that one is correct next question what is the next question now this is a very interesting question it is saying that the detection of the car crash collision which results in the deploy right deployment of the airbags almost instantaneously so you have to consider you have to consider the different uh, actions. The first is that during the collision or during the you know accident of a car, there are the airbags which are you know which are actually opened instantaneously. Now, second is the detection of the accidental free fall of the laptop towards the ground, which results in the immediate turning off of the hard drive. Okay. Third one is saying that detection of the tilt of the smartphone which results in the rotation of the display between portrait and landscape mode. Now, this is a very, very interesting question. This question actually cannot be solved by the conventional knowledge of, uh, you know, the science and technology until and unless you are aware about the applied part, right? All of you must have heard about this term, accelerometer. The question is saying that how many of the above actions is the function of accelerometer required? Guys, <clears throat> in all of these actions, there is a function of accelerometer, okay? Basically, basically in mobile sensors, if you might have heard, you know, seen any reviews or any review videos of mobile phones, etc., you might be aware that there are the accelerometer sensors which actually sense that if you are, uh, you know, tilting your mobile and automatically your screen gets changed, it gets changed to the landscape mode if uh, it is uh, you know, horizontal. So, that basically is due to the accelerometer without a doubt, even in the cars as well, if there is a sudden change of the, you know, sudden change of the velocity, then also there is a, right, there is the utility of accelerometer which actually prompts the opening of uh, airbags. And the second statement is also correct. So, the right answer to this question, that would be option number, option number C. And yes, that is the answer, which is, which means that all three statements are correct. Now, moving to the next question. Here is the next question that is uh, saying that with reference to the role of uh, biofilters in recirculating aquaculture system, consider the following statements. Now, statement number one. Biofilters provide waste treatment by removing uneaten fish feed. Got it? Biofilters convert ammonia present in fish waste to nitrate. Then biofilters increase phosphorus as nutrient for fish in water. Okay? So, how many of the statements given 
above is r correct okay so once again this uh, the same issue so right answer to this question now let us consider the statements one by one the first one biofilters provide the waste treatment what are the biofilters in first case got it so guys biofilters you know they are basically the group of certain right nitric right nitrifying bacteria okay which actually do the first thing which is written here waste treatment by removing the uneaten fish feed and not just that not just that they actually consume they actually consume ammonia that is present in the fish waste those who are aware about the different types of the excretory systems in different organism or the group of organisms right you might you might have heard the terms like ammonotelic you might have heard the terms like uricotelic or ureotelic right now so ammonotelic basically the you know organisms the organisms which are having the plenty of water they excrete ammonia they excrete ammonia example fish so it is obviously correct it is obviously correct that they convert ammonia present in fish waste to nitrates which are useful and not just that they actually increase phosphorus also and that supplies you know that supplies the nutritious intake for the fish present in the water so basically it's a type of symbiotic arrangement right symbiotic arrangement that leads to the you know, entire setup of the recirculating aquaculture and that is why the right answer to this question that would be option number right b so here sorry so here if we talk about the right the th third one that is they increase the phosphorus right so this question is basically saying that they increase the phosphorus as the nutrient right so they do increase they do increase but right the question is saying that for the fish in water so fish exactly they don't have much uh, application right they don't have much application of the phosphorus intake however they increase the nutrients that is present of definitely for the fish okay now so right answer to this question that would be option number b that only two statements are right two statements are correct here that is the first one and the second one now moving to the next question okay sorry the next question that is uh, consider the following pairs consider the following pairs objects in space and the description objects in space and the description <coughs> okay objects in space that is uh, sea feeds nebula and pulsars sea feeds nebula and pulsars then the description is there that sea feeds basically giant clouds of the dust and gas in space nebula stars which brighten and dim periodically and pulsars neutron stars that are formed when massive stars run out of fuel and collapse okay now if we consider the first statements the first statement uh, description that is giant clouds of the dust and gas in space guys anybody who have uh, you know who has studied the basics of the chapter called universe in geography or in physics that person must be aware that the giant clouds of dust and gas in space that is known as nebula that is known as nebula okay so this is definitely not matched correctly this is not matched correctly so if this is not matched correctly so at least one of them must not be matched correctly so which is that now if we are aware about pulsars pulsars are also known as neutron stars that is a very easy thing i think uh, it is provided it is actually given in the ncrts of class 8th class 11th 9th 10th any ncrt will find the chapter universe you will have this information present that pulsars are also known as the neutron stars all right so this is why at least this statement is definitely correctly matched and if this is not correctly matched so none of them would be correctly matched right so the right answer would that would be that would be only one only one is correctly matched right that is the answer to this question let us see uh, exactly yes this is the answer now moving to the next one consider the following statements statements are given here ballistic missiles are jet propelled at subsonic speeds throughout their flights while cruise missiles are rocket powered only in the initial phase of flight 
Now this statement is uh, actually not making much sense. And why so? Because ballistic missiles, right, ballistic missiles, they are actually the missiles which cover longer distances, right, which cover longer distances. And in fact, in fact, they follow the, they follow the, you know, actual, they follow the continuum, right, continuous path of their flight. And initially, right, in the very initial phase, they are powered with the help of rockets. After that, they fall. They follow the natural path of natural path of their flight. Okay. However, if we talk about the, you know, basically the cruise missiles, the cruise missiles are actually the jet propelled missiles having the subsonic speed. However, this is not always the case. There are supersonic cruise missiles also. For example, Brahmos is a supersonic cruise missile. Got it? But the range of the cruise missiles is comparatively, is comparatively less. In fact, the cruise missiles are more usable or more useful in the precision, right, precision hitting instead of the ballistic missiles which are used, right, mainly for the longer hittings, okay. So that is why this statement does not make any sense. It is a probably a wrong statement. Just a second. Uh, okay. It is a wrong statement. Agni-5 is a medium range supersonic cruise missile. Now, this statement itself, itself, right, this statement itself fails the entire second option. That is, Agni-5 is not a supersonic cruise missile. First of all, this is not a medium range missile. It is actually a long range ballistic missile. And while Brahmos is a solid fueled intercontinental ballistic missile, again, this is wrong. Agni-5 is a intercontinental ballistic missile and Brahmos is supersonic cruise missile in the previous statement only. I just make very, very much clear. So, which of the statements given above is are correct? One, two, both, none. Right answer should be none. D. Right. D should be the right answer to this question. Now, uh, yes, D is the right answer. Now, moving to the next question. With reference to the green hydrogen, consider the following statements. What is the meaning of this uh, term called green hydrogen? Basically, you know what, when with the help of, uh, you know, electrolysis, we separate out hydrogen from water, we use, right, we can use it as a fuel. But if we do this electrolysis, not with the help of uh, conventional sources of electricity, rather we do this electrolysis from the electricity obtained from the non-conventional sources or the renewable sources, then we term it as a green hydrogen. So, it can be used directly as a fuel for internal combustion. That's good. That is okay. Then it can be blended with the natural gas and uh, used as a fuel for heat or power generation. It can be used in the hydrogen fuel cell to run vehicles. How many of the above statements are correct? How many of the above statements are correct? Guys, so the right answer to this question that is, right, all three statements, all three statements actually make sense and these all statements are called correct. Got it? So, in fact, nowadays the government is actually planning to uh, give a push to the green hydrogen basically and this could be a future solution to the fuel crisis, especially when the electric vehicles, you know, they are also going to face shortage because that is dependent upon the production of lithium and when lithium is going to be, you know, on this, uh, on the end, Again, that is going to be a problematic situation. So, this is basically going to be a futuristic fuel now. Next question. Aerial meta, right? Aerial metagenomics best refers to which of one of the following situations? Aerial metagenomics, right? This is a very interesting term. It actually has different subparts like aerial something related to the air, you know, something related to the space. Meta, right, metagenomics. If we talk about metaphysics, that means beyond the boundaries of conventional physics. If we talk about the genomics beyond the boundary or, you know, extending beyond the boundaries of the con right, conventional genomics. Now, use the common sense here. Best refers to the, which of the following situations collecting DNA samples from the air in a habitat of one go, habitat at one go. 
understanding the genetic makeup of the avian species of a habitat, using the airborne devices to collect the blood samples from moving animals, sending the drones to inaccessible areas to collect the plant and animal samples from land surfaces and water bodies. Basically, this term was in the news recently. And if we check this term, the meaning of this term, it comes to be that collecting the DNA sample from the thin air, from the thin air, right? So basically, this question has the answer option A, that if there is a, there is an organism present in any habitat, right, we could connect the DNA sample of that particular organism, right, with very, 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 very close proximity, not by, right, not by doing any invasive testings or any invasive collections of sample. Got it? So, that is the right answer to this question. Now, moving to the next question, that is the microsatellite DNA is used in the case of which one of the following? Microsatellite DNA. So, guys, actually, I would like to say one thing that uh, UPSC has actually, you know, followed a particular trend in last uh, three to four years that they have started asking questions quite in depth from the portion of biotechnology, especially the applied portions of biotechnology where the technical advancements in this field, they are the point of interest, they are the point of interest for the UPSC, at least as per the current scenario. What is the question? Microsatellite DNA is used for uh, in the case of which the following option A studying the evolutionary relationships among the various species of fauna, stimulating the stem cells to transform into diverse functional tissues, promoting the clonal propagation of the horticultural plants, accessing the assessing the efficacy of drugs by conducting series of drug trials in a population. Now, let me tell you that what are the micro satellite DNA, got it? Guys, these are basically, you know, the small, right, small DNA codes, right, which are often repetitive, often repetitive. Actually, they do not encode any information as such, but they are simply the combinations of, you know, uh, you might have heard the names like adenine, okay, thiamine, guanine or cytosine, basically ATCG. This, these are the combinations of the protein present in the, right, uh, with the help of, right, with the help of the bonds, right, hydrogen bonds. So, here, if we talk about, uh, if we talk about these things, so they are basically the repetitive combinations and with the help of this, right, these repetitive combinations, uh, the technologies like DNA fingerprinting, DNA fingerprinting, that is actually able to identify the evolutionary relationships among the various species of fauna, either interspecies or intraspecies, we can actually find out the, we can actually find, find out the evolutionary relations. So, the right answer to this question, what should be the right answer to this question? That should be option number, option number A. And that is, that is the right answer. Got it, everyone? So now, uh, I think uh, you can see this picture, right? Microsatellites, they have just one to nine base pairs. That means they are very small, uh, you know, groups. Then mini satellites, they have the 10 to 100 base pairs. And the macro satellites, they have greater than 100 base pairs. What is the meaning of base pairs? Basically, these are the base pairs, right? Present A, T, no, C, G. So, these are basically the base pairs present across the double helix of the DNA. Got it? So, now I think uh, this was, right, this was uh, it from my side. So, now Atul sir will be starting with the next part of uh, economy and uh, social development. All right. So, I welcome sir, please to the. Hey. Uh... Thank you so thank, much. Thank you, thank you so much. Yes. Right here. Sir, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Just allow me a moment to settle this. Uh, okay. 
just give me a moment to make arrangements so that I could have a better look at what is going on. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I hope I'm audible and visible to all of you, uh, those who are uh, looking at me right now. Well, I guess uh, I'm meeting you guys for the first time on this specific channel. My name is Atul Jain and uh, I take care of uh, economics uh, in general and uh, uh, some of the current affairs and some of the other subjects, other aspects also like it happens in civil services. So some of you must have given this examination this morning. So uh, I, uh, so, so you guys could tell me uh, through comments that how the exam was and what exactly was your perception, was your opinion about the test that happened this morning. Uh, in my opinion, it was a very good exam. It was a very good test. It was a, a very balanced exam, which had some difficult questions as they should be because uh, if they, I mean, the difficult questions actually make a, make a difference between the aspirants who have prepared properly and the aspirants who haven't. And uh, there were some questions which were uh, uh, very direct, very easy. And there were some questions, as I will tell you, with which, which could have been solved by the simple power of deduction, by, uh, you know, not really by mugging up the facts or uh, understanding a lot of things, but by simple analytical deduction that we can do in some of the uh, question papers that can, uh, you know, in some of the questions. So let's move ahead. Let's start with our uh, discussion. So economics part of UPSC this year, uh, I mean, if I can call it economics, so in UPSC examination, it is generally very difficult to create the very distinct categories that whether a question was from economics or a question was from current affairs, sometimes a question appears to be a polity question as well as a current affairs question. Sometimes a question appears to be a, a you know, geography question and a current affairs question and an economics question all simultaneously. But still, uh, the kind of segregation that we have tried to create there are 17 questions in my opinion which can broadly be categorized as the uh, economics questions and we'll start with them easy questions we'll go uh, really quickly with them so the first question that we are going to talk about today uh, is uh, yeah so the first question is that interest income from the deposits in infrastructure investment trust that is in which distribute oh, what happened okay that is not something I expected but Actually, doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. Sorry for this uh, small glitch. Yeah. So interest incomes from the deposits and infrastructure investment trust that is in which distributed to their investors is exempted from tax, but the dividend is taxable. What is going on? So the first question says that uh, we all know what invits are. I mean, if you don't know, then invits are something like mutual funds in which uh, uh, money from the common investor is collected to uh, and that is to be invested in basically the, uh, the infrastructure projects, right? So now the question says that you can earn interest from them as well, right? You may earn interest from them as well and there may be an actual dividend, actual benefit also. So now the question says that the interest is tax-free. The question says that the in okay, I think I'll have to stop using the stylus altogether. The interest is tax free. That is what the question says. While the dividend is taxable. Is it true? Is it correct? The answer is no. Remember that invit investments are not a tax saving measures. Any teacher who teaches invit, he or she tells it very properly that the the profit that you make, the earnings that you make from the invit investments, they are not for tax benefits. That is not the purpose. They are not utilized as a uh, as some kind of a tax saving uh, mechanism. Now, listen to me very carefully. The moment you conclude that the first statement is wrong, the moment the moment you conclude that the first statement is wrong, you do not even need to read the question further. There is absolutely no need to even read the question further. Many people have been saying that this year UPSC has, uh, you know, kind of uh, finished the process of uh, elimination and elimination method is not useful anymore and uh, so many other things. But that is not true. See, we just read statement one. 
we concluded that the statement one is wrong and now we don't need to read any further we just go to the options statement one is incorrect that appears only in d so without even reading the question further i can simply conclude that the answer is d so elimination has always been there right so uh, you have to understand that you should not give up on elimination method which is one of the most important tips one of the most important tools of cracking the examination still we'll read the second option invits are recognized by the by the surfacey act 2002 of course uh, the invit investments they are they are covered under surfacey so uh, because the government wants to make sure the government wanted to make sure that these investments are very safe and secured and if there is some kind of an asset trouble that uh, the money can be recovered. So obviously they were covered under surfacey. So statement uh, one is incorrect. Statement two is correct. That brings me to option number D. That is the answer for the first question, right? Let's move ahead. Uh, yeah. Okay. Anji. So now let's move to the second question. What is the second question? The second question asks me a very simple thing. Uh, in the Now the second question is one of the easiest questions that could have been asked uh, uh, from any economic student. Uh, in the post-pandemic recent past, many central banks worldwide had carried out interest rate hikes. So if you have been studying economics, you are aware that even the Indian bank, the Reserve Bank of India, has hiked the interest rates massively. Our repo rate has gone up, gone up from 4% to 6.25% in the span of what, 6-7 months? Uh, similar trends have been fo uh, fo uh, you know, followed by the American Fed and everything. So th that has been the pattern. So we are aware of that, that after COVID, uh, the reason for that was the inflation. Uh, because post-COVID, the demand uh, kind of increased. And after that, uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict happened, uh, which led to the increase in the prices of commodities. And one easy way to control the commodity price was to increase the interest rates. So that is correct. Statement 1 is obviously correct. We are aware of that. So statement 1 is correct. Uh, Statement 2 says central bank generally assumes, uh, central banks generally assume that they have the ability to counteract the rising consumer prices via monetary policy means. So, I mean, when, uh, he, when you are taught monetary policy, this is the precise meaning of monetary policy, right? I mean, uh, you must have been taught this, that uh, the basic idea of the monetary policy of Reserve Bank of India is to control inflation. That is the primary duty of any central bank in the world, right? So, obviously, the banks believe that if they do the monetary tightening, they can control the inflation. So naturally, statement one is true, statement two is true. And the, uh, if this the reason of, if, if statement two the reason of statement one, I always uh, recommend the because test here. That you have to go for a because test. In these questions, you have to go for the because test. Just read the statement one, put a because in between and then read the statement two. If it makes sense, then it is correct. Then it is option one. So in the post pandemic, blah, 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 central banks worldwide had carried out interest rate hikes because central banks generally assume that they have the ability to counteract the rising consumer prices via monetary policy means makes perfect sense. The things were getting expensive and central banks worldwide believe that if they tend to increase or if they use the monetary policy means they can control the prices of the things and that is why they utilize that Op answer becomes option number a right clear hua? is if it clear to everyone it becomes option a so should be very simple very very basic absolute basic of economics this question was right now let us move ahead this board is uh, not working very uh, amazingly but uh, pr probably we can make do with this uh, let's see if it allows us yeah, this one is the simplest question. What do I even teach in this, right? I mean, uh, what if sterilization? What if the process of sterilization? Sterilization means, uh, what, is the, what is the meaning of sterilization in general? That's something which is very activated, right? Uh, you reduce the activity of that. That is called sterilization, right? We all have seen sterilized water, sterilized ionized solutions. What is the meaning of that? That you tend to, uh, you know, kind of reduce the activity of any active agent. So in an economy, what is the active agent? The money, the liquidity, that is the active agent. And whenever uh, we talk about sterilization, it means the Reserve Bank of India or whatever the central bank is, they are absorbing the excess liquidity. That is the basic idea of sterilization. And all these things, I mean, I don't even need to read further. The open market operations, 
when when anyone teaches you open market operations, that is the first thing. What are open market operations? RBI comes and sells and buys the securities in an open market. The idea is to absorb the excess liquidity which might be there in the market. So conducting OMO, open market operations, is obviously the correct answer. There is no doubt about that, right? So, uh, I mean, it's the basic. When, when you start uh, studying OMO, the open market operations, that is how the lesson of OMO starts. That, uh, uh, that is how the lesson of OMO actually starts, that it is one of the processes of sterilization, which is uh, adapted by the Reserve Bank of India or the central banks anywhere in the world uh, to make sure that the markets are not extremely potent that the markets are kind of uh, reined in, they are controlled in a way, so, right? So that is the basic idea. Now, remember that the other options, please understand that, I'm not saying that the other options are totally out of the league, right? So for example, regulating the functions of NBFCs, right? So NBFCs might be lending very indiscriminately, it is possible, and RBI might control that, that is possible, that might also happen. So in a way, it may also lead to some sterilization somehow. But in UPSC, you are supposed to choose the best possible option. Always remember that, right? So there can be other options which are which appear to be right. I mean, which appear to be kind of, you know, borderline okay. But you are not supposed to go with them. You are supposed to go with the option which is absolutely bang on correct. So that option is obviously option A in this one, right? So let's move ahead. Hmm... Okay, options are also coming. Answer is also coming on this one. So now let's go to go for this one. Consider the following markets. Right. Uh oh, sorry. I pressed the wrong button by mistake. Consider the following markets. Government bond market, call money market, treasury bill market or stock market. How many of the above are included in the capital market? So, okay, what is going on with this board? Chaliye. So now what happens is, when we talk about the capital market, one important condition of being capital market is that, I know, see, capital market is a chapter which appears rather tricky to many of the students because it has a lot of terminologies. Right, and, the, and those are not very common terminologies, right? Uh, you read about a lot of markets and a lot of, uh, you know, kind of uh, capital instruments, which you might not have heard of earlier, or which you might not be listening to or talking about in your day-to-day -day life. But the important thing is that it gets some very easy, very, very simple questions. So uh, that's why I always recommend that this is one chapter every student should prepare properly, because the questions are extremely simple on this. They just ask simply, simple uh, definition based questions, right? So capital market means they have to be long term, they cannot be short term. So let's go for a very, very simple thing. Government bond market, obviously, it's a capital instrument, correct? Call money market. Call money market is a market which lends money bank by bank overnight. So it's just for one night, you know, so a very, very short duration. So obviously, it cannot be capital market. Treasury bill. What are the durations of T-bill? 91 days, 182 days. Is it long term? No. Never long term. Stock market, they are generally long term, right? So, uh, so stock markets are generally used for raising capital for a long term period. So this is also correct. So one and four are correct. The answer is only two. Okay, what is going on? Yeah, answer is B as we have seen here. Oh, I can go directly also without deleting it. That is such a saving grace. Uh, great. So now this is a very interesting idea. Uh, small farmer, large field. What exactly is small farmer, large field? So small farmer, large field is, you know, see, our agriculture. So I have to tell a little about this because, you know, what happens is this is, a, this is, this is an experiment which has been conducted in uh, Indonesia. This is, an, uh, this is an experiment which has been conducted in the Indian state of Odessa. So what happens is that one of the biggest problem of agriculture culture in a country like India is the scalability problem. What is the scalability problem? That uh, when you have a very small size of farm, then, uh, you know, you cannot really make it profitable because you have to invest, right? And in a very small farm, you cannot invest, right? So again, the thing is, for example, if let's say I'm a farmer and I have this big a farm, Right. Now, it's a very small farm and I need irrigation, I need, uh, uh, you know, uh, the fertilizers, I need electricity, I need a lot of facilities uh, to uh, make sure that this uh, farm, piece of farm gives me good output. But I have not been able to churn the capital to do that. Right. Now, I'm a small farmer, I alone cannot do that. And I have my friends, my neighbors who have similar kind of farms. 
right? There are many uh, farmer friends of mine who have very, very small farms. So what do I do? So the idea is small farmer, large field. So we all, the, all, all these small farmers, they actually gather, they collect and then say that let us start treating our field as a single unity. That why don't we start treating our field as a single unified field and then whatever facility we require to use, we may require uh, those facilities or we may start utilizing those facilities for this one piece of field at one go. Right. So some basic decisions, right, uh, of investing, of, you know, the methodology of agriculture, we can take together. But more or less, uh, we are, we small farmers are gathering. And now, let's say if we want to, want irrigation, we can put a tube well here and the entire large piece of the land can be irrigated. Right. So a lot of things can be done for this large piece of land and the scalability problem gets solved here. Right. So that is a very, very important aspect. So let's look, uh, look for the correct one. Uh, yeah, so it's B. Many marginal farmers in an area organize themselves into groups and synchronize and harmonize what is going on. Yeah, uh, harmonize selected agricultural operations. Exactly as I told you, that is the correct answer of this one. This is what uh, small farmer large field means. Right? So it was in news, it was in current affairs. Some of you might have read that. Otherwise also in classrooms also, um, this has been taught and discussed that uh, especially when, uh, you know, we were discussing the scalability problem of agriculture, this has been discussed, right? Now, uh, MSP, this is a very, very simple factual question with common sense also, you can answer that. The government of India provides the MSP for Niger seeds, that is uh, uh, those uh, small black seeds, right? So obviously government of India has been encouraging these things. So the, it provides the minimum support price, very correct. Okay, again, some problem here, yet again. So, but anyway, uh, this is correct. Niger is cultivated as a kharif crop, you must know this. Uh, when you study agriculture, these are some small uh, discussions, right? See, I know that many of you uh, might not have any exposure of the farming life or uh, of the village life or the process of agriculture, but this is the basic knowledge that you must know. And all these things are there in NCRT books also, that uh, which are some of the most important crops of uh, kharif, rabi, zayad. So all these things you should remember. So some of the crops you should remember. That is uh, expected out of you, right? So this is also correct. Now the third statement is very interesting. Third, sit third statement says, some tribal people in India use Niger seed oil for cooking. Now, listen to me very carefully. Even if you do not know the third statement, you can tell it I mean, I mean, you can guess whether it is right or wrong just by common sense. Just by using sheer common sense, you can tell whether uh, this statement is right or wrong. How can you do that? Just imagine, they, ha they are telling some tribal people in India use Niger seed oil for cooking. If you are saying, just imagine, if you are saying that this statement is not correct, then what are you implying? You are implying that there is absolutely no tribal person in India there is absolutely no tribal group in India which uses this seed oil for cooking. In a country like India, which has so many tribal groups, such a massive tribal diversity, can you guarantee that? So, I mean, just imagine how, how ridiculous does it sound? Can you say that there is absolutely no tribal group in the country which uses this seed oil for cooking? Of course, there will be some here. I mean, some people would be doing cooking with everything. Right. So this statement has to be, this statement has to be correct. That even if you have not heard of that tribal group, you will know that there will be some tribal group in the country who would be cooking is then this. So of course this has to be correct. So third statement has to be correct. All three has to have to be correct. That becomes the answer of this one. Chali. Now let's move to the next one. So see, this is very interesting. This is very important uh, that in UPSC, you don't need to know all the statements all the time. Many times you can make what I call educated guesses that these are the educated smart guesses you can make and they can kind of help you reaching the correct answer, right? Uh, which are the intangible investments? You know, what are tangible, what are intangible? Tangible investments are the one which you can touch and feel. You can hold them. Those investments are the tangible investments. Intangible investments are the ones which you cannot really hold or, you know, you, can, you can't really touch. So brand recognition, is it tangible or intangible? 
right so for example study iqis as a brand you know of this brand right many of you are aware of this brand it's one of the very popular brands in civil services uh, preparation right this brand has been created by providing good quality content good quality videos good quality solutions to the students right but if i say can i hold the brand identity or so people watch our channels people watch our videos people because people trust us right so can i hold the trust you you cannot hold uh, the trust if i would have invested that let's say in building an office or in building a house or buying a land i could have you know kind of gotten hold of that land so it's not a physical asset right trust so many people spend money on let's say a cement factory has been a cement company has has signed ms dhoni as their brand ambassador why because they want to create the perception of trust right so ms dhoni was a very trustworthy person when he was a cricketer he is he is still a cricketer not in the mainstream cricket but in ip but uh, the the trust that ms dhoni carries that trust has been transferred to that cement brand that has carried ms dhoni right so that people sign sharukh khan because they want to uh, uh, use the popularity uh, of sharukh khan in creating the trust uh, for their own brand so that brand recognition is a intangible investment you spend money in that it's an investment sharukh khan doesn't work for free ms dhoni doesn't work for free right so even in study iq creating this uh, top notch content for you it has not been free but it's an investment uh, by which we are building a brand recognition right so that that investment is an intangible investment for sure inventory inventory is obviously obviously tangible Inve inventory is what what is there in my go down right so if i am building uh, uh, cars there are 100 cars lying in my go down of course they are tangible so this cannot be intangible two is definitely wrong intellectual property intellectual property obviously is my research is my work right so it can be tangible uh, right uh, and uh, generally it can be, it is considered intangible so when i produce right some of you will say but sir uh, uh, research can lead to production but research in itself is not production right intellectual uh, uh, you know commodity intellectual thing so for example if i am a musician i'm creating music i'm ar rahman i'm creating music my music is my intellectual property so i am i can't hold my music i can make a cd out of it and hold that right i can't really hold ar rahman cannot hold his songs right so it is also intellectual property is also an intangible investment mailing list of the clients as we all keep getting emails and all that so it's a marketing uh, tool which is obviously intangible it's just the contact details so 1 3 and 4 they are all intangible so only 3 are intangible inventory is obviously tangible so that is the basic idea uh, very common business thing i think i'm sure if even if you wouldn't have studied that you would have been able to do that very comfortably uh, now yaar this is one question uh, which uh, uh, which is uh, based on the discussion that has happened about how the states should perform how the states have been doing their things uh, so what happens is uh, because i think uh, this is a question which you will be able to do only if you have studied that if you haven't you will not be able to do that so what happens is finance commission actually distributes the money uh, it does the tax devolution so tax devolution is of two kind one is vertical it's of two kinds one is vertical vertical devolution is between center and state and there is horizontal uh, devolution horizontal is between is among the state right so these are the two kind of devolutions that take place vertical and horizontal uh, vertical obviously because center is above the state in the hierarchy and horizontal is state to state devolution so in that uh, among the states when the revenue is distributed when the tax tax revenue is distributed uh, there is a formula there are some criteria which are utilized which are kind of uh, given impetus which are which are considered while the money is distributed so in that uh, they, are, they have said that uh, other than population area and income income difference the margin of the incomes what are the other things so in this uh, obviously see one thing which we can obviously comment is wrong is the stable government 
right so if a state does not have a stable government it is not really the fault of the people of the state or it is not really fault it is not a bad thing not to have a stable government economically because it's democracy right if people do not like one specific party if people are giving a fractured mandate uh, the people cannot be punished for their mandate right it it will be absolutely unconstitutional uh, to punish a state for uh, giving a fractured uh, mandate it is absolute i mean it is the absolute right of the people to deliver the kind of mandate they want to so this obviously has to be wrong right apart from that right so one think of uh, one confusion see demographic performance it is there uh, demographic performance has a 12.5 percent weightage right so all these things are there in the in the finance commission report uh, there is a 10 percent weightage of forest and ecology also and the tax and fiscal effort it has a two and a half percent weightage right there is a weightage of that uh, government government governance reforms is what the compromise area or was the, uh, I mean, that was the confusion in this question. Many of students actually thought that the governance reforms should also get a weightage. But the problem is that governance reforms are not very clearly defined. And also the tax revenue becomes kind of the right of the state. So center can give additional aid to the students who are implementing certain reforms. But the same standard cannot be applied on the idea of the tax devolution because that becomes the constitutional rights of the state. That becomes the constitutional right of the state. So 3 and 4 are not there. So the answer for this should be uh, only 3 B. Okay. Yeah, so only three is the correct answer for this one. That only three things are there, demographic, uh, uh, apart from these, population, area, and income, and income difference, apart from these three, demographic performance, forest and ecology, and tax and fiscal effort. These are the uh, criteria which are generally considered while we do the horizontal tax devolution. Okay, let's move on, uh, go to the next one. Consider the following infrastructure uh, sectors. Consider the following infrastructure sectors. Okay. Uh, okay. I somehow by mistake showed the answer but because this was, uh, anyway, this is a slightly controversial one, but anyway. Uh, so, uh, okay, this is working. So there is this, this organization, UNOPS, Sustainable Investment in Infrastructure and Innovation, S3I, it, uh, I mean, the what are the focuses of its investment? I don't know what is going on with this board, why it is changing the slide again and again. So see, I'll tell you one thing. This is one question in which I think there is massive confusion. Uh, there is some kind of confusion in this question because if I go to the website of UNOPS, it mentions these three mass rapid transport, healthcare and renewable energy. These are the three pointers, these are the three things that the website of the UNOPS clearly mentions that F3I are, uh, you know, kind of, uh, 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 you know, investing in these three matters. But if I look at the new cycle, when I look at the new cycle, I get an inkling, I get an idea that, uh, uh, you know, I get an idea that, uh, there was some kind of a controversy. There was some kind of a controversy that uh, this uh, affordable housing, uh, there was some kind of a conflict that took place in the affordable housing ecosystem also. They were running a project on affordable housing that did not really materialize very well, right? So, um, uh, there was a new cycle uh, in, I think, July, August of 2022 that was in discussion. So, uh, both the answers, I believe, uh, in my opinion, the answer should be all four. But many, uh, uh, but if you look at the website, the answer is all, th uh, is just three of them. So, uh, probably we'll get a more clear picture picture uh, when UPSC releases its uh, uh, its uh, answer answer key. Uh, but as of now, I believe it should be all four while uh, the general answer keys are telling it to be the three of them. So we'll have to see which one UPSC goes with. So this is, uh, but don't worry, every year uh, there are generally one or two such questions in which there is some kind of, uh, you know, there is some kind of uh, conflict uh, among the various options and we get to know that which one uh, UPSC considered to be a better option. So uh, generally um, these things happen in UPSC. You should not be very worried about that. It's perfectly all right, right? So one or two such questions are there every year. Uh, so this year probably this was the question. So this answer key also tells it only three, but uh, you can take it with a pinch of salt, right? Now, government schemes. Never ever leave them. 
Never ever leave them. They provide you the marks for free. I always say government schemes are the free marks. Absolute, absolute free marks, right? So uh, you have to be very, very uh, clear about that. They are free marks. And uh, if you know a few things about them, they will be uh, free. Of, I mean, those marks will come to you very, very easily. Uh, they will be you know, absolute uh, dolly for you. I mean, they will be free gifts. So Janani Suraksha Yojana, as the name suggests, suggests Janani means mother. If those of you who understand a bit of Hindi, Janani means mother. So this is one thing we should do. The, the yojanas, the schemes which have their names in Hindi, you should uh, understand their English translation also. Because that will give you uh, some kind of an insight in, even if you have to guess, right? So it is a safe motherhood intervention of the state health departments. Wrong. It's a central scheme. Definitely wrong. It can. It is not done by the state departments. Its objective is to reduce maternal and neonatal mortality rate among the poor pregnant women. Doesn't the name suggest that? So Janani Suraksha means mother's security or mother's protection scheme. So obviously the idea of uh, mortality among the poor pregnant women, the neonatal problems which they go through, we have to reduce them. That has to be the basic objective of that. So uh, two is absolutely correct. There is no doubt about that. Uh, it aims to promote the institutional delivery among poor pregnant women. So when it comes to the neonatal health or the delivery or the you know kind of mortality that happens uh, among the young mothers or the mothers while delivering, one of the primary reasons of that mortality is because uh, uh, that a lot of births are actually non-institutional. Uh, mothers, uh, women give birth in their homes in the uh, without any kind of medical intervention. So that is a very big problem. So because of that reason, what happens is uh, that, uh, you know, uh, if you promote the institutional delivery, if you make sure that the women are delivering children in hospitals or anganwadis or uh, some with some kind of medical attention with a, with a midwife or a nurse or a doctor present, then they will be uh, more safe. So obviously, three is to be correct. Uh, its objectives includes uh, the uh, providing public health facilities to sick infants up to one year, one year of age. Uh, not exactly in Janani Suraksha, but Janani Suraksha uh, says that we talk about taking care of the infants, right? The health of the infants and medically, uh, economically also, the definition of infant is up to one year of age. So this is also a part of Janani Suraksha Yojana. This is also correct. So two, three, four, uh, three are correct. C should be the correct answer for this one right that is my opinion that's correct right let's go to the 52nd anemia mukt bharat strategy uh, in india that is free of anemia what are the uh, 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 the following uh, statements in the context of interventions being undertaken in the anemia mukt bharat that means to make an in india that is free of anemia the first statement is it provides uh, uh, it it uh, provides uh, it, it provides uh, prophylactic uh, calcium supplementation for preschool children adolescents and pregnant women now a lot of you have marked this correct because, you know, we have a tendency that the moment we see a scientific kind of a statement, a long statement, we get tempted that it should be correct. But anemia is not caused because of lack of calcium. It is caused because of lack of iron and folic acid. So naturally, this one is wrong. First statement is wrong. Right. So it they talk about calcium while calcium is the, the lack of calcium, while it is very problematic thing for the growth of children and uh, uh, health of the, the, you know, kind of the bones and everything, but it does not cause anemia. Right. So please understand that. Uh, read very carefully. Don't be in a hurry while solving the paper. The first statement is wrong. It runs a campaign for delayed cord clamping at the time of childbirth. That's true. When a child is born, the cord clamping should not happen right away. It should happen slowly in some time because that gives children uh, adequate amount of, uh, you know, kind of folic acid and um, whatever is required to treat anemia. Uh, anemia, that is true. What is happening? This is correct. Uh, it provides for periodic deworming of our children and adolescents. Very correct. Because, um, uh, you know, lack of hygiene, there are a lot of uh, uh, worms in the in the gut of children and adolescents. So if you keep doing deworming regularly and frequently, obviously your health improves and that uh, reduces the risk of anemia. That is also correct. It addresses the non-nutritional causes of anemia in endemic pockets with special focus on malaria, uh, uh, hemoglobin, uh, hemoglobinopathy and fluorosis. Right. So science and technology part, as I told you, economics is fused with a lot of other subjects. Uh, it is not just uh, nutrition 
or lack of nutrition that causes anemia. There can be other reasons as well. So uh, this program talks, uh, I mean, talks about the other issues which are related to anemia as well. This is also correct, right? So again, a government scheme, a very, very widely talked about government scheme. So uh, that is why this has been in news. So uh, this, uh, again, this answer is wrong. They, they say all four, while calcium is not the primary cause for anemia. Right. Uh, consider the following statements with reference to India. <laughs> sorry, oh, sorry. Huh. According to the MSME Department, uh, blah blah Act. Uh, hmm. This is very troublesome. Yeah. Uh, the medium enterprises are those with investment in plant and machinery between 15 crore and 25 crore. Is that even correct? I mean, when you study MSME, the first definition you study uh, that uh, recently it has been modified that for the medium enterprise, for any enterprise to be a medium enterprise, the investment has to be 50 crore rupees, right? The investment has to be 50 crore rupees and the turnover has to be 250 crore rupees. So this is the correct number. This number is wrong. I mean, if you when you start studying the MSME chapter, that is the first thing any teacher teaches you. Every book teaches you. So I'm sure this was very easy. All bank loans to the micro, small and medium enterprises qualify for uh, under the priority sector. This was a PIB notification in 2023 only uh, because the government after COVID, the government wanted to uh, increase, government wanted to boost the MSME sector. So the government uh, made sure that all the loans, Generally, there were some restrictions, but the restrictions were diluted in a very big manner and any bank given loans to the MSME sector were considered as the priority sector lending. So, uh, the statement 1 is wrong, statement 2 is correct, so answer becomes 2 only B, right? And that is B, correct. With reference to the central bank digital currencies, the, okay, uh, CBDCs, Consider the following statements. It is possible to make payments in a digital currency. What is going on? Digital currency without using US dollar or SWIFT system. Remember, CBDC has been very, very widely discussed. RBI have issued a very large note about it. The governments have been talking about it. The private sector has been talking about it. So it is not cryptocurrency. Please remember that. Cryptocurrency is not under government's control while CBDC is totally issued by RBI. So it is issued by Reserve Bank of India just like any other currency, right? So the point is that CBDC, uh, the purpose of CBDC is, uh, I mean, the first statement is actually one of the purposes of CBDC that we will issue the, um, the digital currency and for that we, do, we, we will not need to convert it to US dollars or to comply with the SWIFT system because the physical currency will not be transacted. It will be digital, right? So the first statement is correct because this is one of the aims, one of, one of the reasons that we don't want to be extremely dependent on some other country's currency or some other country's uh, uh, you know, kind of convertibility with us. So that is why the first statement is absolutely correct. Now the second statement is again a statement that you can intelligently guess. I always say that if you are an intelligent guesser, you can get at least a few extra marks in the civil services examination absolutely correctly. Second statement says, a digital currency can be distributed, can be, can be is the keyword. It can be distributed with a condition programmed into it such as a time frame for spending it, right? So what does that even mean? It means RBI issues currency. So let's say RBI has issued this 500 rupees note. Right, which is in my wallet right now. This is a 500 rupees note. I did not create it. RBI issued it. It ventured around here and there and it came to my hand. It came into my wallet. Right. Do I have a time limit to spend it? If I want to spend it tonight, let's say after this session, I want to go and have dinner and I can spend it tonight also. I can choose not to spend it for five years also. Um, of course, assuming that the government doesn't demonetize it or some exceptional circumstances, I can, I may choose not to spend it for five years also. 
will it expire? It will not expire. It is not a medicine or some other kind of equipment that expires. It is not going to be like that, right? There is no expiry date on that, right? I mean, we will, uh, it will continue being normal. It will continue existing the way it does. But if it is a digital currency, sometimes the government can make it targeted. The government says that, okay, so let's say the government is issuing somebody, some beneficiary, some digital currency to buy a gas cylinder. Generally, in a family, a gas cylinder is bought every one month, two months, three months. Right. So if a person has taken money for buying gas cylinder from government and is not spending that money for the, th for the next three months, doesn't that mean that the person is doing something else with that money? So the government may put some kind of an expiry date. Right. So that is th one thing. And China is doing that in China, in the, in the digital currency, it is being done. So that is the knowledge part. Now coming to the guessing part. See, whenever there is a question in UPSC, about a possibility of science and programming and technology. Everything has to be always possible. Right. So the, what, what did the question ask you? Question asked you, a digital currency can be, it is not asking it is distributed. It is asking it can be distributed with a condition programmed into it, such as a time frame for spending it. So even if it is not happening right now, it may happen. So if you deny that, you what are you saying? You are saying it cannot be done. How is that possible? Yaar? It's science. Anything can be done. It's technology. Everything is possible. So you cannot, you should never ever deny any scientific possibility. If you deny this second statement, you are denying the scientific possibility that this can be done. While this can be done for sure. The question says it can be done. Of course it can be done. Right? So the second statement is also correct. It has to be correct. There is no other way. Right? So both one and two have to be correct. That is the answer for this one. Again, this is also wrong. In the context of finance, the term beta refers to. What does the term beta refers to? So again, yeah, this is a very clear stock market term. Uh, it keeps coming in the news cycle. So what does the term beta refers to? So let's say this is the stock market. And the generally the stock market is behaving like this. This is the common behavior of the stock market and a stock that you are tracking, that specific stock is behaving like this. Something like that, right? It happens. So this is one stock that you are tracking and this is the market. The red one is the market behavior and the green one is the one stock's behavior that you are tracking. So the idea is that the ratio of the behavior of the green one, the particular stock to the ratio of the entire market. That means particular divided by the entire market. That is known as beta. Very, very simple thing. Let's see. This is again, this is a word. This is a term. If you, so these are such questions. If you know them, you know them. If you don't know them, you don't know them, right? There is no other way. If you don't know them, you can't do these questions. It's as simple as that. So let us have a look. Uh, D is the correct answer. A numeric value that measures. Let me change the color of this. This color is not a very, this color is, might not be very, very visible. Uh, yeah. So numeric value that measures the fluctuations of what is wrong of a stock to the changes in the overall stock market as I told you right so D becomes the correct answer for this one obviously that is the definition of beta. Let's go to the fourth one. Okay, uh, let's go to the fourth one. Where is the marker? Yeah, I'll take this one. The self-help groups, SHG programming was originally initiated by the State Bank of India by providing microcredit to the financially deprived. Now again, these are the questions uh, which, uh, you know, which, so see, if there is such a factual statement, uh, it is very easy to make wrong factual statements, right? So again, I'm not giving you some kind of a very uh, like ubiquitous tip that will always work, but there is always a possibility. So let's say when an examiner was making the question paper, he must have read or she must have read this statement somewhere that the SHG group was originally initiated by 
Actually, it was done by NABARD. So this statement is wrong. By NABARD, by, uh, 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 by providing microcredit to the financially deprived. And the person wanted to make a wrong statement. He just or she just replaced NABARD by SBI. It is so easy to make these kind of wrong statements. So whenever you find such easily made wrong statements, then they are generally wrong. So let's say some if they would have given the year that they started in 1993. So you know that there is a easy possibility that it can go wrong. So more or less they are generally wrong. I'm not saying 100%. Uh, but generally they tend to be wrong. So this statement is wrong. It was started by NABARD, not by SPI. In an SHG, all members of a group take responsibility for a loan that an individual member takes. That is the entire concept of SHG. That is the meaning of SHG. That of course, uh, the individual people do not have the credit worthiness. So uh, people, uh, you know, uh, take loans and the entire group is responsible for that loan. That is why they become uh, eligible for the loan without any collateral also. Right. So this is correct. The RRBs and the scheduled commercial banks support the SHGs. Of course they do. Right? Government will make sure. How will they not support SHGR? I mean, government will uh, be after their life if they don't support them. So two and three, both have to be correct. So only two, P becomes the answer. Uh, this becomes, what is wrong with this? So only two is the, let me use my finger probably. No, this is also not working. Uh, where am I? Yeah, this was the question. So only two is the correct answer. Uh, and this is B. That's correct. So we can move to the next one. Consider the uh, following statements. Yeah, yeah, this is working. India's public sector healthcare system largely focuses on curative care with limited prevention, promotive and rehabilitative care. Do we agree or not? Right. So in India, the, there is a robust healthcare system. I'm not saying that there is no healthcare system, but it generally activates when people get sick. Right. While uh, the ideal concept of the healthcare system should also be to make sure that people are taking care of themselves so that they do not get ill. Or if they get ill or if they get, de you know, incapacitated, I mean, a few days back, there was an article in the Hindu that how Kerala is setting up an example in uh, rehabilitative care that people who have gone, you know, who have suffered from uh, tragic uh, illnesses, uh, the heart illnesses or the spinal illnesses, they are being rehabilitated. Uh, the rehabilitative care has been taken care of. It's being taken care of, but it is not very normal in India. We we are very focused on curative that if you have an, have an illness, Come to me, I'll give you medicine and cure it. So that is correct. Statement one is definitely correct. Under India's decentralized approach of healthcare delivery, the states are primarily responsible for organizing health services. Of course, we know that the uh, health comes under the states. Health, uh, I mean, there is a health minister of every state. There is a health secretary. The health, I mean, I mean, we are aware of that, that health comes under the state. Now, if the second statement and explanation of the first statement, what do we do? We always do the because test. As I have always told you, I mean, this is a this is a tip for CSAT also. Always in in these uh, in these uh, assertions and reason thing, always put in because in between and see if it makes sense. So India's public sector healthcare system focuses on curative care because states are primarily responsible for organizing health service. Does it make any sense? So what? I mean, uh, the states are responsible for the health services. Why does it mean that uh, only uh, we will only focus on the curative care? It does not make any sense at all, right? So naturally, both are correct, no doubt about that. But it is not the correct explanation. So B has to be the answer as it is written here, right? So uh, that is uh, another thing which is uh, which we need to understand. Okay. I think 89th, the another question. So uh, 89th question is also a, a one case where you need to actually know because all three statements look correct here. The problem with 89th question is that all three of them actually look all right, right? See, the problem is the stability and growth pact of the European Union is a treaty that number one limits the level of the budgetary deficit of the countries of the European Union. Number two, makes the countries of the European Union to share their infrastructure facilities. Number three, enables the countries of the European Union to share their technologies. 
all three look all right. I mean, that is what countries should do. They should help each other. They should provide uh, assistance to each other, right? That is what the uh, what countries should do, right? That is absolutely correct. But the problem is that when we talk about the stability and growth pact, Europe has always been, uh, you know, in trouble because of the budgetary deficit, right? So uh, we all know what happened in Greece. We all know what happened in Spain. We all know what happened in Italy. We all know what recently happened in UK. So Europe, European countries have always been in trouble when it comes to the budgetary deficit. So this specific treaty, this specific pact of stability on growth pact, it was like in the like, like the FRBM Act of India. Are you aware of what FRBM Act is? F FRBM Act was when the government actually fixed target, the um, parliament uh, fixed target for the government of India that your uh, deficits should not breach the specific percentage, right? So that is what the stability and the growth pact has been that the European countries, they need to follow uh, some kind of a specific guideline that these are the numbers which you should, uh, which should not be breached, right? So rest ideas, rest of the ideas, number two and three are good ideas, but they are not a part of the stability and growth pact, right? So the stability and growth pact is only the first one. The budgetary deficit has to be controlled. Two and three are not a part of this. So only one is correct in this, right? So this is the correct answer. So, uh, this this is uh, this is it so that's it for tonight uh, i i hope that uh, your examination uh, was all right. I wish that uh, you would have done the examination decently well. Even if you have not done the test well, even if you have not performed very well, it's perfectly all right. It's okay. Uh, please understand that no test, no exam is uh, the final destination of your life. Uh, you will get more chances. Some of you must be the beginners and some of you might be seeing this program just to understand the kind of questions uh, UPSC actually asks uh, and uh, the kind of test you will be put to uh, in the coming years. And I think that is a fantastic approach. Uh, there is nothing better uh, than uh, learning from the actual questions that UPSC has asked. Uh, it helps you gain confidence because if you have uh, studied uh, some, some chapters and you were able to solve those questions, uh, then it, it kind of increases your belief that you will be able to do it. And the questions are not from some other world or some other universe. They are general simple questions. Secondly, they provide you with some kind of benchmarking that some of you might be uh, getting that belief that, okay, I have done a chapter really well from some sources, from some institution, from some books or notes. But when you actually attempt the question papers, your performance is below par. So it is a wake up call for you that you need to probably uh, kind of push your uh, preparation uh, two notches up uh, to make it reach the standard of UPSC. And uh, the next thing is that, of course, uh, sometimes it, it may also happen that you might believe that my performance was not as good uh, while I have finished the chapter. But please understand that in UPSC, uh, there is no chapter wise segregation. UPSC does not ask, let's say, five questions from inflation, three questions from uh, monetary policy, two questions from capital market or nothing like that. One question can carry inputs from multiple units, multiple chapters as well. So uh, it might be possible that you have done monetary policy, but you have not done fiscal policy. Uh, that is why some part of the questions you were not uh, not able to understand or perform well in. Uh, but that's okay. That's fine. That's a part of learning. Important thing is that if the question, if you are a beginner, if you are a beginner only then, even if the question paper was making some sense to you, I think you were in the right direction. So I wish you all the very best and I thank you very much for joining me and my team, the Study IQ IAS English team here today in this discussion and I hope that you would have learned something from this session. Thank you very much. Have a great night and all the best for the future. Bye-bye.